Well, bom dia. Welcome to uh, Cascais uh, in Portugal. We're here for the third event of the 52 Super Series, and that is the big one. It is the Rolex TP52 World Championship. We've got nine boats here racing, all of them brand new. We've got a fantastic forecast for the week, expecting uh, 18 to 20 knots all the way through the week. Welcome to Nick Baird, uh, our young uh, co-commentator this week. Nick uh, joined us last year, we remember, in Portals and is back for more. Nick, what do you think of uh, Cascais then? Oh, it's my first time to Portugal. It's beautiful here, great win, great racing. A great place uh, for racing. Cascais has got such a great reputation and it's going to enhance that reputation I think this week. Uh, seen of so many uh, championships uh, over, the, uh, over the years we've been here. I think this is their fourth time for the 52 Super Series. The first time we've had a world championship but uh, the, uh, the wins do tend to blow. Uh, we've had some fantastic uh, racing and regattas here over the years. Big, big waves and uh, our very nice uh, race course tends to be a little bit one-sided. But uh, we are the first time we've been here in the middle of the summer and uh, lots of holidaymakers around. Uh, the atmosphere in the uh, town is just absolutely electric. Lots of people on the beaches. And uh, the Atlantic is the uh, race course. It's uh, open ocean and uh, we get days like this sometimes strong winds and this will be a very different test to Croatia where we had two two regattas of relatively light breezes much more exacting almost closed uh, in arenas and this is open water so very different moding for the boats and perhaps we'll see a different hierarchy it was uh, the first two regattas uh, did certainly were good for the owner drivers. The chat on the dock here is that maybe this will be a pro driver regatta, but uh, the world champions are Harm Muller, Spears, Platoon. Nick, your thoughts on Platoon? Do you think they could win the, uh, the, the title again? Oh, for sure. I mean, all the boats out here are getting so much more competitive and you can see that in the overall results, but uh, Harm and those guys are good. Harm's a great driver and they very well could do well here. Indeed, Harm uh, has won the Dragon regattas here before, but uh, He's, uh, he's really one of the cool, calm and collected uh, owner drivers and uh, we spoke with him earlier on. But uh, yesterday's practice race gave us a little bit of an indication who's uh, blowing hot, although it was lighter yesterday. It was uh, Quantum Racing which crossed the uh, finish line first, but Phoenix were up there as well. Point for Quantum Racing is that Dean Barker is back on the helm, Doug uh, DeVos steered in Croatia. Uh, in, uh, in Zadar, the last regatta, and they're a quick shot of Onda. Well, of course, they feel at home. Closest thing they've got to a home regatta for the uh, Brazilian team, speaking Portuguese, here in, uh, in Portugal. And Azura then, a team looking to uh, win the world title again. Their uh, series, their circuit has not been so good up till now. And uh, a quick shot there to Prevets, another team which really would need to make the, or want to make this uh, world title their own. There are a few boats which have uh, underperformed this season and a world title really would make their season, wouldn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, any owner would be happy with a world title no matter what the season looks like, so. Absolutely, and of course the uh, top teams uh, all in the mix. Uh, Quantum Racing, I think, have won the, we've had 10 world championships uh, over the history of the TP52, champi TP52 class, uh, and uh, Quantum Racing have won it five times, so maybe their favourites here. But we did speak with the Harmuller Spear, it's a very cool and calm on the surface, and he feels no pressure. They won it last time in uh, Scarlino in Tuscany, and uh, he feels that they're in good shape. So with Harmuller Spear, the uh, 2017 52 Super Series World Champion. So Harmuller Spear, the World Championship, the Rolex TV owner driver of Platoon. How do you feel being here then? Ah, it's a really nice place. I mean, it's, it's a, little, a little bit untypical. We have a really cold season here. Normally, it's a pretty much warmer, but uh, right now we have the fir had the first day with typical wind conditions here, a lot from the uh, northwesterly or westerly directions, and um, feeling good. Do you feel more nervous with it being a world championship or are you just the uh, same as every other regatta? Yeah, I mean, no. I mean, what we achieved last year was a great uh, achievement and we're not, uh, it's like a normal regatta. Otherwise, you, if you're feeling nervous and make yourself nervous finally, then you have no chance to win. And how do you change things for this, this regatta then in terms of the breeze? Uh, we did a, a little bit of keel changes and uh, some weight movements in the boat. We, we developed a new mainsail, uh, did a little bit of the headsail. So, well, we try to figure out how it works. And how important is it to win here? Ah, it's, it's, it would be great if we are winning again, but I mean, there are so many other challenges and um, it's open like any, any other regatta. 
what's your experiences here? You've won a few regattas here before in other classes? Yeah, we, we, we uh, sailed a lot in the Dragon class here and uh, we had gold cups here. We won uh, the, the King Juan Carlos trophy. We had all the time tough wind conditions, but sometimes if, uh, if it's cold and foggy, end up like a lake regatta here. Well, as Harm Muller Spreer says, he's raced here many, many times before with the Dragon. Uh, totally comfortable and this very solid team. Uh, they really have made no changes to their lineup over the last couple of years, and that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. The familiarity with the team is a big deal, uh, especially in a venue like this where it's going to come down to close tactical situations and you're going to need to have the boat handling to execute it. So we uh, spoke with Nacho Postigo, the uh, weather, tame weather guru on the Prevetsa. Uh, Nacho was explaining the uh, science. Why do we get such uh, good uh, northerly breezes here? Uh, and it's all down to the uh, Portuguese trade winds. And this was Nacho. So Nacho Postigo then from the uh, Prevetsa. Nacho, why is it so windy here? Why has it got such a good reputation? What causes the breeze? It's a typical uh, summer situation in, in, in the peninsula. And you have like a thermal low in the center of the peninsula and you got uh, the high pressure of the Azores and squeezing a little bit against this low pressure and the stronger it gets this low pressure because of the heat the more compression of the isobars is and the stronger north trades if you want as they call them um, they are and then you have the local effect of the Sintra Sierra there is a small mountain there that accelerates and bends the wind around it and together with the local uh, uh, heating close to uh, Lisbon area, it's, uh, you get that effect of the trades and then enhanced by the, uh, by the geography of the corner and the, and the heat of the, of the shore. So it's a breezy area, but it's quite subtle, the different trends out on the water. It is, but it's, um, it's always um, a little bit, I mean, we all know which road we have to go. It's a little bit like the opposite of Palma, so I'm not going to explain more. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but even if it looks like it's always the same track, uh, there's always small wind pressures caused by the, uh, by the Sierra. Sometimes it's a little bit more windy offshore, sometimes it's a little bit lighter inshore, sometimes it's very even. And you have to pick up and say how much or uh, decide how much you're going to bet into one extreme or the other or stay in the middle. And that opens uh, the track a little bit more than what it looks like. And Prevets, are you big betting men, are you? <laughs> I think we haven't been betting very well. <laughs> so you have to bet more? Uh, we have to uh, start better first. Um, after that we'll see. It will be easier. So Nacho Postigo then as uh, ever blinding us with science but uh, really giving us a good picture of uh, why the, uh, we have this uh, nice strong uh, north northwesterly trade wind which blows down the coast uh, and wraps around the corner here in, uh, in Cascais. But conditions, as I said, are looking uh, excellent for the day. Azura then, uh, say, are one of the teams which really would like to put their name back on the world title. Their season has not gone as well. Uh, they are 25 points off the uh, series uh, circuit standings at the moment. We spoke with the Colli Parada, who's the strategist uh, on the Azura, and he was explaining that really they wanted to get things back on track here in Cascais. So here we are on the eve of the Rolex TP50 World Championships. You've won the World Championships twice before. What does it take to win here this week? Yeah, it will be consistency as always. Uh, and no mistakes on the maneuvers. Uh, it's going to be a different venue as the ones we've been previously through the season. And it's going to be more, more breeze and more waves. So we have to be up for the game and and be ready for everything and on top of that we need to sell well as well so it's a, it's a tricky conditions but we are really happy and looking forward to it it feels different to zadar and to Shibanek. yeah it's different obviously we enjoy those venues uh, we didn't have the results we were expect, ex expecting there but yeah here we know the place we've been here before and and we know what we can get uh, from the race course so Everybody has the same feeling as well because everybody's been here, but the season goes on and we need to keep progressing and tipping away. That's right, the first two regattas were not what you wanted, but how important would it be to come away with the World Championship this year? Yeah, it's always important, it's a bonus for the season, but we are we are thinking on that, but we are thinking on the season as well. So, yeah, we, we are going to give our best and hopefully we, we can fight for it. 
So it's Colley Parada then as the strategist uh, on the Azura. It's been a difficult start to the season for them. They've brought in uh, uh, they've brought in uh, Santi Lang as uh, as a tactician, a big change. But uh, obviously Santi, a fantastic sailor in his own right, he's had success in the Olympics. But it, and the culture is the same; they're all Argentinian. But it's been a very difficult uh, transition, just in terms of the small details of communication, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got when you're the driver and you've got your tactician who's talking you through every single maneuver and every decision that you guys make and t telling you a plan and what mode you're sailing up when and all kinds of things like this. So getting used to the way that you communicate with your tactician can oftentimes cause you know several situations, especially on the starting line, that could lose you eight or nine points I all think at this once. Is, this is, I think this has been one of the keys this season really has been the absolute small fine detail coming off the start line because the starting, we've seen the images uh, both on the, or on, or on, the uh, on the screens and the photographs on the start line so often the boats are absolutely lined up to mm. within centimetres. And also what uh, Santi was saying when we've spoken to him, it's just about the, the, uh, the amount of communication and the, the, the subtle changes in the communication. How much does he drive what he wants? How much is he list listening to the team what they want? And I think they're starting to get here. And I'm pretty sure that uh, Azura might be one of the teams that uh, they're also a team that are very comfortable in the stronger breezes. So let's have a look at the uh, series standings. We've had two regattas, uh, both in Croatia, and uh, Quantum Racing won one of them. Uh, Luna Rossa won the second one. But Quantum Racing are uh, on 73 points, just four points up on Sled. Sled have had uh, two very good regattas. Platoon uh, also been on the podium both times, uh, and they're also on 77, so really, really tight at the top. Then Luna Rossa then in fourth now, the winners uh, in Zadar on 81, 10 points back to uh, Phoenix, then Allegra 96, battle uh, for 6th uh, and 7th between Azura and Allegra, uh, Azura on 98, Onda 103, Prevetsa 110, Gladiator who are not here uh, 128 and Paprec also not here are on 136. <coughs> so very very tight at the uh, at the top and so many teams just talk about the whole the whole season Nick it's not just about the world championship here isn't it? The Terry Hutchison always telling us it's a marathon not a sprint. Right, well, you know, in order to find the best sailors, you're going to have to look at them in all the different conditions. So looking at Zadar and Kier is totally different. And so you're going you're gonna to see at the end of the season who's the best team, not just at the World Championship. Who's your money on? Oh, I don't know. It's pretty hard <laughs> to tell, but I, don't, I wouldn't be able to tell you right now. Well, maybe we'll have a better idea by the end of this regatta on, uh, on Saturday. So the course orientation, the course orientation to say we, uh, we're in this northerly breeze, and so it uh, tends to be blowing down the uh, down the shore there, looking at the uh, the course area now. And so it does tend to be a little bit of a one-sided track. Uh, and uh, all the tacticians and strategists after guards know that. We do see quite often see this unseemly battle off the uh, start line. Uh, but it's uh, we'll be doing I think probably two windward leewards today, and the conditions are certainly good enough for that. We should get them back to back, and uh, much much. Uh, more straightforward uh, work for our uh, race teams on the water for Maria Torrio. So we're looking there, uh, getting a good idea of how the conditions look. And that's uh, Prada, the uh, Luna Rossa, the winners of the uh, Zadar Regatta. Conditions looking pretty good, Nick. Yeah, and you're, uh, the breeze filled in quite nicely this morning, early on, 10 o'clock, and then it's just going to keep increasing throughout the day. We might see a little bit of a shift to the right or left, but it, it's pretty much steady in the condition in the in the direction that it's coming from already. Um, so what we're going to probably look at is that that most of the tacticians would agree that the right side is going to be a little bit better. Um, there's just a little bit more of a of a shore effect there that's giving them shift and and a little bit more pressure, but. You know, all these boats are the same speed, and their starting is getting so good that right. it's very difficult to There's fight only for one those or two lanes. Boats can really exactly. get that lane, isn't it? It's so it, you know, you might see a couple of boats that are going to sort of air towards the the pin end of the line, and and they're they're definitely not going to go to the left side, but they might yeah. be on the left side of the fleet, uh, just going out to that right side, and it's going to be. I mean, everyone's going to get to the top mark uh, at the same time, and it's going to be about a stern when they get on ley line there. Um, so the question is for all these tacticians and strategists is where is going to be the best spot to stack up on the ley line? And that's the biggest question for these guys uh, to you know put points up and down the board is 
you know, can they sneak in late port tack approach and get in in front of a few boats, or do they set up early on starboard and expect that a few people are going so to mess up and uh, you know take a few points that way? So that's it's that old risk reward thing, isn't it? Isn't it particularly at day one? How far? How fast? How far? How far do you push in the first day? Right. Uh, knowing that uh, every point is vital and you really can't afford to screw up on day one. What is they always say that you can lose, you can't win the regatta on the first day, but yeah, you, can you can certainly lose, certainly it. lose so it. I think the uh, after guards will be very, very much aware of that. But the uh, breeze seems to be nice and solid. I think we had uh, wind direction of 330 from about 18 knots. Looked quite gusty and puffy uh, on the water from what we could see. But uh, this is a, a nice contrast to uh, Croatia where the uh, winds probably averaged uh, less than 10 knots over the course of the two regattas. It was very much about uh, subtle uh, changes in boat speed and wind speed and uh, it was quite often I think it was Ed, Ed Reynolds who was saying it's like uh, bay racing where you have to pick a side early on and stick with your side uh, and that really was uh, a very apt description. And I think with the greatest respect, Phoenix did that particular job quite well. They, uh, I don't know whether you watched all the races there, but uh, they managed the uh, starboard tack lay line quite nicely, got good starts and got out there early. And that really was their, uh, their passport, I think, there. Did you watch? Yeah, no, I watched all those races. And for sure, the Phoenix guys did a good job um, just sort of playing the open race course and understanding what the shifts were like and understanding the shore effects and things like that. And uh, they... You guys made a mention of this on, on the commentary last regatta that they did a very good job of staying away from the fleet and we'll probably That's look right. to see them do that something similar again here especially with the breeze up a little bit um, it's very easy to make mistakes um, and and have that cost you seven or eight points when the breeze is up this much and break things or you know so in a ch the change on uh, phoenix of course we had tina platner steering in uh, croatia and here uh, the owner has a huge experience Hasso platner is back uh, Steering. How does that change your uh, the uh, the setup at the back of the boat from your father's approach? Uh, I'm not exactly sure. All I know is that you know, like you said, Hasso has done a lot of racing on his own right, and he's a very successful sailor, so he's yeah, yeah. got a lot of experience. Um, but it does raise the bar a little bit when his daughter. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Gets I, second in her first the, regatta. They've it's got a little a bit of extra pressure <laughs> for Hasso today. They've got a very nice uh, relationship between no, them. It's it's nice yeah. and competitive, but it never goes a little overboard, and so. Uh, Tina's done a very good job the last few years, um, you know, just sort of observing and learning as much as she can. So she came out of the blocks very well because of how much learning she's been able to do from just being around the program. And so I'm sure she's very happy with her result there. But uh, I expect the team is just always trying to push forward no matter who's driving. Indeed. So uh, we're inside the uh, start sequence. We've got a minute and 40 or so to go to the uh, start of the first race of this uh, Rolex. TP52 World Championship, Breeze has said about uh, 17, 18 knots, nice shot there from the, uh, the drone looking down the line, looks like we're setting up towards the uh, right end of the line towards the committee boat end, Nick. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, unless they favor the pin end, everyone's going to want to stack up towards this right hand side. They know the right's better, they know they're going to get 5, 10 degrees shift there just because of the way that the wind bends around the shore. Um, and so you're going to all the teams are going to want to take as much advantage as they can up there. Uh, the only question, like I said earlier, is how can they stay away from the fleet? And you might see boats trying to come in late at the boat, or you might see boats trying to yeah. start more down the line to stay away. Or, you know, you might see more of the owner driver teams, or the, excuse me, the pro driver teams sort of getting more involved in the fight. I mean, you see Quantum right here in the middle, happy yeah. to stick their nose in between a bunch of boats there and, uh, you know fight for the best spot, which they're totally capable That's of getting. That's what uh, Dean Barker's paid for, isn't it? So yeah, right. And looking at Luna Rossa trying to come in from uh, quite high on the, uh, on the line at 35 seconds. Nobody down towards the left end anyway. 30 seconds, Nick. Yeah, well, you, you, with a big right shift, it looks quite, quite lifted on starboard there and with a lot of... Uh, a lot of bias for the boat. And that must have been the go there and you got, what, four boats late? Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, nice start there from uh, Sled uh, and Quantum with Prevets in the middle. First to tack out are Azura. Not yeah. surprising there. I mean, everyone's going to start tacking away and getting to that right side where they know the advantage is. Um, the only decision that's going to be made by boats like Quantum is they know that the boats that are going to the right are going to gain an advantage. So how much leverage do they give? Um, and so they're going to stay there as long as they have to. Platoon is certainly 
keeping the fleet there. So it, the question for Platoon is, how long do they stay on starboard? And how long do they stay on starboard pinning the fleet there uh, and let boats like Azura and Luna Rosa, who's just tacked out on the port, get get to that right side and yeah, get that, start from Luna that Rosa, advantage? I think, squeezed out of the committee boat end of the line. All this seemed to be coming in high. So the uh, regatta winners, the Royal Cup winners in uh, Zadar last month, off to uh, a difficult start. Azura don't look too bad going out to that right side. The question is always how early do you go because the uh, the land converges with the course if you like. So you go too early, you have to sail a little bit further to get the geographical shift. And uh, there does tend to be a little bit more pressure offshore just now. And the pressure is slightly more erratic as you get closer to the shore, particularly as you get up the course. Yeah, for sure. And these boats are going to be looking for that little bit of, of right hand shift at the top as well, which is going to be a little bit more important than the pressure differences when the breeze is up this much. Um, but to be, you know, to your point, Andy, uh, that as you get towards that right side, the Sintra Mountain is going to start causing a little bit of uh, yeah, uh, you know, unsta instability, instability out there. And uh, so you could have some some lulls of under 15 knots while the rest of the guys are sailing in 18 to 20. Um, but you see now everyone's flopping over, and now it's just going to be a speed game. And the more if you can gain a boat length, then you might be able to make that one cross the ley line that gets you across, you know, across eight boats instead of having to duck. Yesterday in the practice race, we saw platoon come in, you know, mid fleet on the virtual eye and had to duck everybody on the starboard tack ley line. So everyone's going to be on port for a while now, and then as we get towards the ley line, it's going to be a little bit of a jockey for position to see how well these boats can set up for the ley line game and and which one can come out on top. So that's the most left side boat is uh, Sled. Ray Davis uh, and Adam Bischel are the uh, after guard. Both have had a lot of success here over the years. You can remember Ray racing with uh, the uh, Emirates Team New Zealand and uh, prior to that, I think, with uh, Mean Machine. Never one to uh, s sail the percentages up the middle of the course is, uh, <laughs> is Ray, but uh, liking this left side early <coughs> on, I think. Yeah, well, Maybe you know, they just uh, couldn't get to the right, but uh, they don't look too badly there, too bad at all just now. No, the way that the 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 breeze is going to bend around, there's a there's a big point out, you know, yeah. a few a few miles north, and the breeze bends around it. So uh, if you're out above the level with the point, then you, it's actually not so bad, is it? Well, down down, it takes a while for that breeze to bend. So yeah. down the course, there's actually going to be a nice left shift yeah. uh, compared to the mean. But yeah. as they sail up on port, you're going to see on the virtual that the right boats are going to gain more and more and more. And I think the virtual is, might be a little bit off on the... So Luna Rossa have got some, uh, some work to do there over well, 200 meters behind. Well, they've got an issue, eh? The, their jib's down. All right. So there, something something is is wrong on board Luna Rosa. So you see them trying to figure it out. But for sure, I think this race is probably, you know, they might be too late for this one, and they're going to just try to figure it out and get back into the certainly not into the program. There. So I wonder whether that happened just uh, before the start or on the start line. Oh, I imagine it happened about a minute ago. They were seemed in a very vulnerable position, so yeah. they're probably just trying to stay out of the way. But there they are, jib down, maybe a halyard broke or something. We're not sure yet. Um, Very disappointing we'll find start out. for them, yeah, sure. Too bad, but certainly that's how things work, especially when the breeze is up this much. I mean, And of course, just to emphasize, this is probably as much breeze as they will have sailed in. Um, and in fact, uh, in terms of the, the week, this will be the most the strongest breeze mo for uh, the most consistent period. We've had one or two uh, days or afternoons with... Uh, 17, 18 knots, uh, thinking of early on in the season and a couple of days here and there, but uh, it puts a lot of strain on the boats. And of course, Luna Rossa was the last boat to be uh, to be launched and it's at least uh, sailing time of the fleet. And just to emphasize, all nine boats here are, are uh, brand new this season. Right, well, the Luna Rosa guys, I mean, for sure, it's uh, it's a newer team, but I bet a lot of these guys have had plenty of experience There's on the no boats. There's no shortage of experience. No, just for sure. Haven't got the, the time on the water with the boat yeah. in, these, in this kind of conditions. For sure, and, and I think, you know, it's a little bit of time on the water and a little bit of just, you know, sailing is a, is a lot about equipment, and sometimes it breaks, and sometimes you can prevent it, and sometimes you can't. Um, I imagine that they probably did everything that they could to prevent that, and uh, something they might not even be sure what broke. Um, but for sure, when you've got 18, 20 knots, the boats are under a lot of pressure. The loads are measured in tons, and uh, things can break very easily. Indeed. So we're looking at uh, quantum racing then. Uh, 
to weather off the uh, platoon on this drag race to the right side of the track. Prevetsa in the mix as well, lying third. Yeah, well, like we said, it's just going to be a, a speed race, drag race out to the to the right hand side here. I mean, most of the boats will likely go to Leyline on Port Tack now, and maybe a couple will try to come back early and force other boats around. When you have a small fleet like this and you're already in the top group, uh, you tend to try and push some of the other boats around uh, if, you ha if you're in a position to do that because you can force them back and make them lose a few boat lengths by doing a few extra tacks or just by pushing them towards the pack where they might go slower because they have to pinch or duck yeah. or whatever it is. Um, so you might see boats like Quantum, Azura, Platoon, you know, start to put themselves in powerful positions that's pushing the rest of the fleet backwards uh, just to extend their lead. I think Azura looking quite decent coming off that, uh, or the earliest to tack out to the right off the start line. Yeah, well, that's the goal for everybody, right? I mean, they want to start at the boat end, seem very favored in that line. Uh, and you'd like to get off the line on that side of things and tack away right away. Um, you certainly see even the boats that didn't have quite as good a starts, you know, Onda and Phoenix are out here sailing. They're, they're not trying to get away from the fleet. They're trying to go to that right side. So you just see how important that is for everybody in here. And, uh, you know, everybody's sort of in, in agreement. So the, the only question is, as we come up here, is some boats might overlay, some boats might not, and you know, where are we going to see boats stack up on ley line, and do they dig in to try and get more of a of a gain by the right side, or do they just try to stay away from things and let the fleet battle each other out and then come in late on port? Riskier move, but I'm sure that some people will try it. So that right side uh, seems to be quite decent for Azura just now, and have not even, uh, as you say, got out to ley line, but starting to look to be in a position where they will be able to control that side, it's largely down to how they position relative to, uh, to Quantum. Quantum a little bit more conservative. Right, well the danger of, of going to the right is that if you don't clean across the boats on port, yeah, you're in trouble. then you're going to get a lee bow. And uh, in the bree when, it's when the breeze is up this much, that often doesn't hurt as much as when it's lighter because the tacks are so much slower, it's very difficult to get a very close lee bow on somebody that really hurts them. Um, but, you know, you might see if Azura is not clean across everybody, Quantum might tack in a, in a lee bow and put the pressure on them. Or we'll Quantum, the Quantum might duck under Azura here uh, and, you know, attack up on above them. And if Azura hasn't hit the ley line, then they won't be able to tack back and cross Quantum. So, it, you know, it's a l it's, it, it is also risky to be on the right side for these guys, unless they cross everybody. And if they That's do, right. then they're pretty especially happy. Especially in the lifting breeze, it's hard to, you have to have that lay line absolutely perfect. Right. So, you know, we might see the boats that duck Azura here gain a little bit more by being further right, um, in which that would might put some pressure on them to, to have a good lay line approach up at the top, or they might just extend far enough in the starboard tack lifts that they've got here uh, and just, you know, not, not be worried about the rest of the fleet for the yeah, rest of the race. Since they've tacked Azura, seem to be just in the uh, slightly lighter pressure. It's a little bit more dotty, a little bit uh, more up and down. It's getting closer to the, uh, to the land. I think we can uh, have uh, Jenny Tullock. Jenny, can you hear us now? I think you guys are right. Azura backed out kind of at a nice time, actually. I'm not sure. They're not quite ley line, but as Nick was just explaining, it's a little bit too soon to go all the way out to the line. You could give up a lot of extra distance if that right shift comes in. And so it looks at the moment like they're crossing Quantum. No, Quantum's going just barely going for the duck there. So they weren't quite fully crossing Quantum. And Quantum's gone uh, to duck Azura, and then we'll have to deal with the boat that's just tacked in Azura's wake. But I think Quantum is actually going to cross them. So it looks like that. that's platoon. platoon. So perhaps this is the, the ley line in fact, because Quantum now tracking as a lee bow um, underneath the tune. So maybe to our eye, it looks like they weren't quite there yet, but they might have all decided that if the right just comes in later, this will be the lee line. So the next question here is prevent the cross is through is the same. Can they make it across? Should they lee bow? Is this the ley line? And, and as Nick was saying, these are all really, really crucial moments in this decision making process here. Is, is everything. It's and prevents are looking quite good as well part. coming across on poor. Just they uh, are, and they're going for that same option, the lee bow there. So lee bow and quantum. It's going to be a difficult spot to hang, actually, because they haven't had a great, they haven't had a great tack in those waves. I think, unfortunately, for Peter Holberg, the driver on board, Professor, he 
just couldn't get the timing right with the waves and the spot where they had to go. So we saw them drop hard after the tack wave, having to fair away deep to get a good speed build angle. And then underneath them, sled came up and actually they leave out quite a bit further away. Now that might just be an owner driver having a conservative leave out, or it might have been a better position in the waves. But as you guys can see out here, it is it is beautiful cast skies conditions. This northerly breeze is ripping in. We only have about 17, 18 knots, but it's forecast to get all the way up, maybe even to 30 knots this afternoon. So we can just expect the breeze and the waves to keep building through the day. Yeah, well, you certainly see in the, these boats pretty pretty big right shift uh, for them, and you know. The virtual is saying they're pretty far off ley line, so I'm not sure what the what the deal is, but uh, the virtual might be a little bit off. I mean, you see platoon tacking away here. And um, quantum. And quantum. So maybe there's some uh, some port tack left to go, and uh, you see boats like you know Phoenix and, uh, and Azura just going away from the fleet and away from the ley line to try and see if they can allow the other boats like platoon and quantum and Prevetsa to do exactly what they did and tack on each other and slow each other down uh, while the other boats might just stay away from the from the pack and from the trouble and just go a little bit faster. Azura started to look quite comfortable relative to uh, Prevetsa just behind them for sure. Prevetsa have tacked across as well. Oh yeah, well Azura is going to be very happy about um, you know that exactly what I said about pushing the boats around. They tack in a spot that uh, you know when sled comes behind them and tacks on their hip then they force Quantum to choose whether they have a very bad lead bow attack because they wouldn't have been close enough to get in front of the bow of Azura, or a duck and then an immediate attack to, to avoid platoon on starboard. Um, so Azura is sort of just causing chaos in the back of the fleet, <laughs> and you see that they, they've extended their lead by 50 meters by doing so. Yeah, exactly. And at the same time, Sled, staying out of the fray and seemed to be doing quite well. Just, I think, out to to Leward and just behind Azura. Yeah, well, you, you know, you'll see that this is going to happen. I mean, you've got the pack of four boats up yeah, there playing that each are other going off, to be, one you know, the other and, uh, and they all tack on a starboard when the lured most boat on port tacks because they have to, and then they're all not quite making ley lines, so they all go back again. And then each time they do that, they lose a boat length or two uh, on the rest of the fleet, and you see boats like Phoenix and Sled gaining, hopefully, from the pr perspective of those two boats. Um, that way, but you know they also are not as far on the right side where you can see a little bit of gain from shift. So, so there we're seeing Azura having just tacked Jenny. Yeah, Azura playing a good conservative covering call here. There are, as you guys said, a pack of four boats just to their right that they do need to stay ahead of. And unfortunately for all of these teams, every time they tack, especially in these waves, they're making big losses. On the last little group of tacks there, Prevetsa actually made the biggest gain, so they had their best timing in the waves. Quantum Racing kind of made the biggest loss, I think, of that pack of four. But Azura is much more capable of picking their spots. They're, they're out free. They're not being forced into lead bows. So they can choose a really nice moment in a left shift and maybe a flat water to go across. And then they can sort of pick in this loose covering moment here where they're just tacking now to cover this pack of four. They can again pick. I mean, it's a loose cover. So you sort of have a, a eight to ten boat length window of where you could tack compared where you could tack compared to that pack. And so you've got to assume that GA Parada is looking at where the best spot is in the wave to really be able to not just get the bow through but then accelerate out of the pack afterwards. And, and they've done so nicely here. So I think looking below them, that pack of four, it really was Prevetsa who... It, to my mind, did the best job in the previous set of tacks to start even getting ahead of that fleet a little bit. But as you guys were saying, the flag might make some huge gains here. I mean, they might be able to come up right at the end, right on the final ley line, because I still am not sure even that Azura has gone to the ley line. It looks like possibly they have um, to our eye now. It looks like maybe they have Azura, perhaps, but not the fleet of four. So for Sled, it'll just be all about whether when they tack up, they'll actually have a piece of that little pack of four, whether they'll have to be crossing behind, but it made some major gains. And I think for sure they've had clean air sailing out here by themselves instead of um, sitting in the bad air like quantum racing is doing. But it's, it's a very typical that, that leave out, if you have a leave out on someone or on a pack of, on a pack of boats, and you know it's a short distance to that ley line, then often it makes much more sense to leave out instead of make the huge stuff. Because if you make a huge stuff, next time they have a lead out on you or a full cross on you. But if you can force them out with a lead out 
and then you can lean on them on the final lay line, then ultimately you're winning at the mark. So I think that's why we saw that that big clashing duel of lead outs earlier, and now it looks like Quantum Racing, unfortunately, is the biggest loser of that clashing duel because they've just had to check out Duck Platoon, and they're heading probably what is the final starboard lay line this time, but they'll be um, they'll be at least fifth, if not sixth, this like gets ahead of them. Yeah, well, the virtual is showing them in a big loss there, and uh, you know, saying that even Phoenix is up above them now. But you certainly like see that those—that's the challenge out there—is that the boats want the right side, but only a couple have the lanes to make it work. And so then some of the other boats that are behind might gain by going to the left side. A li well, you know, relatively left uh, of the fleet. Uh, I imagine Azura is probably, I don't know what you're seeing out there, Jenny, but I imagine they attacked on ley line. It would be smart for them, now that they've allowed the fleet to get compressed behind them, to just hit the ley line and get as much of a gain af afterwards as they can. But we're looking at ley line now. Uh, it looks like Quantum probably nailed it, or maybe just whoever's just below them, uh, probably right on ley line. So I don't know if Azura is going to make it here. Will they have made a big game by not doing those final tacks? And I think so. It looks like they're crossing behind Preventa, but they might be crossing ahead of Platoon. They might even have to do a little tiny stuff for Preventa here. You, know, you can see the bow going down now. Bowen just calling the calling the duck for sled. And I think it has just become a bigger duck. So whether or not they're going to make Platoon is the next question. But Preventa then tacking in as well. So Preventa using sled as a blocker. They'll see sled bow go up when they get close to platoon. They'll know they have to tack them. So Preventa choosing a good moment there for the double tack. And they can kind of delay as long as sled's still in the middle of the tack and then avoid one sled on starboard. And I think that means they'll be cleanly into second here. So yeah, Preventa completing their tack there. Sled making gains, as we said, while the rest of the fleet was in that massive tacking duel. But it is Azura, the Italian team, who's been struggling a bit so far in this season. They, as we spoke about, had a new tactician no. on board, Captain Belonge, the gold medalist. But look at them taking this race, at least at the top mark, with a quite a good margin. This is this is a bit of redemption, I think, Andy. I think it is, Jenny. Just uh, looking at the stats just now, they haven't actually won a race this uh, this season. And uh, Prevets are coming in for second round the top mark. Also a team looking for uh, a good regatta. So Prevets around second, then it's going to be um, Sled uh, and Allegra, I think, side by side. Oh, sorry, platoon. Of, of platoon there, and quantum racing, as we said, big loss in the in the double tax earlier. Just a horrible set of waves for them to do their double tax. But as they're rounding the top, reaching mark now, the offset mark, setting their kite beautifully. I was talking with some of the quantum racing boys earlier yesterday, earlier this morning about yesterday's practice race and how you could really <laughs> surf down these waves. They said today will be a bit windier. For like eight weeks, more like a 49er, Jenny. You know what that's like, where you're skipping over the way. So Azura doing just that, setting their kite gorgeously in first and actually rolling into a jive behind them. For best surrounding the top offset mark in second. Sled has just almost broken the overlap for third here. And behind them, it is Allegre. Apologies, I was calling the platoon, but you're right. It's Allegre down 19, the Grey Boat in fourth at Quantum Racing, also going for a jive set. Not a beautiful set for Quantum. A late and now they've set into um, fifth position there. Behind them, Platoon with an early set to have been, and then we've got Onda and eighth and Phoenix in ninth. So unfortunately for Phoenix, that middle middle left position wasn't working out. Onda was, was bowed off the start or back to the right earlier, and we're at least able to benefit a little bit from that right shift. And I, I apologize, you guys, I must have been calling Platoon and Allegra wrong on that upwind. I think it was... No, you were you were um, certainly right I early on, Jen. I think Allegri came into to later on in that in that beat and certainly did well around the top mark in third. 
So what's the strategy I then? Don't wind. Well, no, I like I like the early drive. I think. Yeah, oh, for sorry, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I think it's all the same things. You're right, Jenny. The early jibe is, is, uh, tends to be what the teams would choose to do if it was a little bit lighter, but the early jibe is difficult to execute when the breeze is up like this. So uh, now you're going to just see lo people looking for lanes uh, to jibe on the port. And most boats will likely jibe uh, you know, pretty soon here. Uh, the same reason that the right worked, course right worked upwind is the same reason that the course right or you know, left looking downwind is likely going to work on this run. Uh, just a little bit of better shift out there and a little bit better pressure uh, in general. So you're going to see the boats just probably making a little bit of gain on that side. As I look across the course now, it looks like everybody is going for the drive, except for Platoon. Platoon holding, holding a, li a bit longer on starboard here. Maybe they, I mean, we know they don't like to be this far down the fleet. We know that Shalkaseki likes to play conservative and play the shift and maybe they think they're on a tiny bit of a left shift and they could just make one final gain against the other eight votes by staying on the shift longer and I'm, I'm not sure about which side will have better pressure I absolutely agree that there's a right shift near the shoreline out here on this race course with the northerly breeze coming down the, the coast of Portugal essentially the, the right side is to the right of the race course and so there is always this, this bend in the breeze as you guys are saying so on the upwind, it's much easier to get a lot closer to that shoreline. On the downwind, you're feeling much steeper angles, so you're not really necessarily getting into that right shift. I think a lot of the boats thought they were rounding in a righty, so it was, it was necessary to go for the early shot. But I don't know. You know, I, I sometimes really disagree with AK's um, uh, tactics. I remember last we got a thing, something about him, and I have to debrief him on that shore. But uh, I, I know for sure there's still the only boat here on starboard drive in fact they're just getting set up to roll into a drive now but you got to assume that something was going on with the red direction for for josh to set to be to be feeling so different to the rest of the pack he's not one to follow the sheep he's one to stare at the numbers no, but, so yeah. i think this will be interesting to see if they make a game we quite often see more pressure down uh, down the outside and uh I can remember many regattas where we've seen boats make big gains down that right side, even though, as you say, the shift is inshore. Well, it's more that as you go down the track, you're going to see a right sh or a left shift. So yeah. a, a lift on port late is bad for the boats that are coming in as you're coming back from you know from, from where platoon is. Down. So you're basically platoon is is committing to sailing a lifted jibe uh, the whole time, basically. Uh, whereas the other boats are committing to sailing a headed jibe, and the headed yep. jibe is better. But if we'll Platoon can get in left. a little bit more pressure and, and pick up the boat speed by a knot or two, which can easily happen in planning conditions like yeah. this, uh, you know, increase in pressure makes a big difference, and I'm sure it's a bit spotty out there being close to shore. Uh, so, you know, it's very possible that they could make good gains here, especially if they're going fast. Let's watch Platoon then. Coming down that right side, looking downwind. But uh, certainly, in terms of simple images, the best images we've seen uh, all season. This is what we came to Cascais for, and uh, Cascais delivering. There's Harmuller Spear. Maximum concentration. Everyone at the back of the bus. Yeah, well, the joke in this breeze is that the, the driver becomes the bowman because, exactly. he, you know, He protects the, uh, the crew from the, uh, the spray, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's as far back as they can get. Boats planning on downwind, probably picking up That's, you know, uh, yeah, 12, 13 knots of boat speed. Dirk de Ritter there, cheese uh, playing the main sheet downwind. And the grinders earning their uh, keep. Yeah, I think Jenny just saying they made a little bit of a gain down this right side. So yeah, they're coming together the quantum look here. At, uh, look at Azura. <laughs> That's a statement of intent, if ever I saw one. Yeah, so Platoon making a good game. We'll see if they... Unlikely they cross Quantum here. I think Probably going to have to roll into a jibe, or Quantum jibes on top of them. I think or they wave across, all right. So that's definitely a wave by Quantum. I mean, they weren't uh, safely crossing there. And uh, I think that both boats sort of agreed that they didn't want to have a maneuver done, and that they were happy to just keep going. Indeed, as saying, uh, we've seen this a few times here in uh, 
in Cascais, the uh, right side, steadier breeze and quite often a little bit more breeze has paid off and uh, John Kostecki spotted that, working of course with Jordi Calafat, the strategist uh, on board. Yeah, well, there's a lot that goes into that decision and, yeah. uh, you know, confidence in your boat speed and things like that is super important. And like I said before, I mean, most of the strategists and tacticians are probably going to be betting on uh, the course right side working most of the time. And, uh, you know, I imagine that Platoon was happy to stay away from the fleet since they were behind. I mean, they were just in a position where they could go with the fleet and uh, stick with their position, probably hang on to that position, maybe lose a boat, but uh, nothing too much to lose from going down the right side. Well, for sure for that. I mean, the, the thing about going, you know, driving right away with the rest of the fleet is there's fewer passing lanes that way. Yeah. There's fewer ways to get around boats because they're going to fight for their position with you. Whereas if you get away from them, you know you're fast, uh, which, you know, I'll bet that their, their average speed is a little bit up compared to the other boats. Harm's a great driver. Those guys doing a really good job downwind. Um, and, you know, I, I'll bet they made a lot of the gain off of pure boat speed there. I think so. It'll be interesting to see there in this uh, stronger breeze how the uh, how the Vrolic boats do stack up relative to the uh, Botines. Whether the uh, two design offices have uh, converged in the uh, uprange conditions. Yeah, that's a good point. Looking at Platoon and Prevetza, the two Vrolic boats. You know how they're doing. Up wind, always, down this wind, was all always that. the uh, these conditions were always the uh, Vrolic sweet spot uh, in the uh, previous generation. But uh, interesting, Quantum may have come back a little bit down that right side, looking downwind on Azura. I think this is where you're starting to see what you were saying exactly, Nick. The boat's on the left now, coming back in the lighter, slightly lighter pressure. Yeah, well, relative to uh, Quantum and Sled. I would say also you certainly are seeing uh, gains from the boats that have, uh, you know, the professional drivers on board or, you know, yeah. and uh, certainly Quantum making big gains on that downwind. Uh, in the big waves like this, uh, you know, ha having a very, very steady, uh, you know, driver that's, that's got great cons with their, with their uh, main trimmer and their tactician is all, or their kite trimmer and their tactician is all very, very important. So. I imagine that both of the pro drivers are going to have a little bit of an advantage here. So that's Azura through the uh, leeward gate. First time down with the lead. This is race number one of the Rolex TP52 World Championship. Azura twice uh, world champions, uh, well, as uh, Matador originally and uh, also as Azura. The gaucho spirit, the Argentinian spirit, is back uh, in evidence on the Azura, leading quantum racing around the... Uh, Leward Gate, Quantum, five times world champions. Just looking now at uh, Prevetza coming through the uh, on the left hand mark, looking downwind with uh, Allegri. Prevetza just have lost a little bit down that uh, down that run. Yeah, and so the strategy at the Leward Gates here, Andy, is that they all want that uh, you know the right hand gate, course right hand gate, uh, and then the right side on the upwind. Um, but the more important thing is to be able to get to the right side. And so if you're like Prevetza and you're coming around that gate and you're rounding close behind another boat and you have to tack out right away, that's not as good as rounding the other side and being able to tack on the port and get to the right side. Exactly. Jenny, we're just watching uh, Onda going through then. No, Onda in seventh place, I think. And Phoenix coming through next. Yeah, Onda rounding, Onda rounding seventh, Phoenix. Sorry, on the rounding eight, Phoenix rounding ninth. The um, seventh no and eighth. between those two in the back of the pack, but I think the, the really interesting was the move from seventh all the way up to third place for, for Platoon. I mean, that was a very impressive comeback. And we saw Quantum Racing as well move from what was about fifth place at the top mark into second. And I think we're, we're very sure that that was the skill of both both the boat handling and also I'm sure a bit of the driving of Gene Barker. But I'm, I'm very impressed by our Muller Spear. I mean, we got to see a really good long shot of him on the downwind, and you guys know how physical it can be for these drivers, but just to explain a bit to the viewers maybe who haven't been on a TP-52 with a tiller steering a boat that is this strong and this powerful over waves in the Sonata Breeze is no easy feat, and you guys could see the 
entire crew snacked in the back of the boat. Like what you're saying, the driver becomes the dominant. I love that, Nick. That was great. But but for these guys, it is no easy task. And to see an owner driver like that take a move, and of course there was probably a bit of a shift and a bit of um, a bit of clear air there as well. But that's not the only thing that was happening for Platoon there. There's got to be some really good skill driving down around in these waves, and to see them move from seventh to third was ex- extremely impressive. And I think those to show why they're the reigning world champion. So, however, we can remember Scarlino, Italy last summer was a, a very different condition to this um, offshore open water big wave venue that we have here. So, it's sort of anyone's game. And at the moment, it's yeah, the Argentinian, Italian, Cesaro who are who are running away with the first. But as we just saw, second all the way to, to ninth is still a very um, up for grabs position. So, as you say, uh, then Azura leading by. Uh almost uh, 200 metres and that really would be a, a big confidence booster just at the right time. I know that uh, Santi Lange has been beating himself up just a little bit. Uh, feels like he's made some uh, not so good decisions over the course of the first two regattas and certainly feeling the pressure, most of it coming from him himself. They're still a very, very strong and tight-knit team. But uh, I think they, I know I spoke. I know that I spoke with uh, Guillermo Parada, and he said this is the regatta they want to win, get things back on track, and they've made the best possible start so far. They put themselves in all the positions to win this one. I mean, they had a great start near the boat. They were able to tack off early, and get to the right early. This is a regatta that's about execution. You know, when everyone on the race course and everyone on the start line knows the game plan and knows what the play is, then it's all about who can execute it properly. And I think the last two regattas have been very different than that. When you're sort of um, smaller bay sailing with, with headlands on one side and islands on the other, nobody ever really knows which way the next shift is going to go. Here, it's very clear. The right side is favored. If you can get to the right, you can win. It's a bit like sailing in Lake Carter. Everyone sometimes even starts on port tack because they want the right side so badly. And I think to see this team execute like this, it's, it's spectacular. And I, you know, no no harm to Santi, because as you say, he already beats himself up enough. He's, he may have the gold medal in the most recent Olympics in Rio, but it, it doesn't mean anything when you come into a fleet like this with such legends racing on these roads. And I think the past two regattas maybe in many ways have been tactically more difficult because it's been more of a question mark of what the sailing was like and which side of the course would pay and what to do when. And I think... He was just trying to learn the fleet as well a little bit. He kept saying, you know, I'm trying to learn these boats and how, how the boats work and how the fleet works and the tactics of this are, of course, very, very different to the catamaran, the two-person catamaran that he won the Olympics at. So I think for them to show that as a team they can still execute and that this is why they were, they were series and season leaders, this has got to be a great boost for all the crew and all the morale and hopefully it will be for, for Santiago Longa as well. Yeah, definitely for those guys. I mean, Santi is a great sailor, but so is almost every other tactician on board right. these boats. It, so it's, I, uh, I think that's what uh, what he's so aware of, that he's got no uh, bragging rights coming into this fleet, even with uh, three Olympic medals, six Olympics he's been to. But of course, he does have a, quite a lot of experience in the TP-52 fleet before and goes, uh, goes way back to the early days. He's been in and out of the fleet, sailed uh, on uh, Phoenix with... Eduardo de Souza Ramos, when the uh, when Eduardo had just uh, built his first 52, and they had uh, some good results straight out of the box. I think second in their first regatta uh, in uh, in Capri from from memory, but that was a light wind regatta. But Azura are very very confident in the breeze. They always have been, and another team that have been together for so many years. Uh, the certainly in terms of the uh, core team. Yeah, well, the conditions definitely make a big difference for that, and it is it is all about execution, especially here in a venue where it's you know starting and getting to that right side. But he did a very good job, like we said on the on the first beat, you know, pushing a little bit of the fleet back into each other and uh, being able to extend that lead to 100 meters. So it's a bit more of a jockey for the position early on now that we yeah, see a lot of these. Right side, isn't yeah, it? well, it's different. I mean, off the starting line, you've got all the boats sort of lined up, and if one tacks, then they're going to end up being in a, in a difficult position. 
uh, with a bunch of boats around them. So they sort of stay for as long as they can and see if they can gain a boat length on speed or not. But on the second beat, they all around behind each other. And so it's a little bit more of a covering scheme. And so you see these boats sort of trying to get, you know, Onda's still on starboard, staying away here, but you probably see them tack on Phoenix to make sure that they're in front, you know, yeah. going to the covering Phoenix towards the right side. You know, you see Azura just sort of separating from the fleet here, but Quantum's worried about Platoon and Sled uh, positioning themselves quite nicely in between the two just to make sure that, you know, whatever goes on, they'll be okay. And I think for them, they're happy to be a step up on Sled so that when they all come onto starboard, they can be in front of Sled going back to the mark and covering them that way uh, with Platoon behind them at less risk of passing uh, because, you know, the right side is a little bit better. Yeah. But this uh, nine boat fleet, you think the uh, you know points become even more valuable. You know, you say that uh, in the previously, you know, you bag in a number of top fours, and you could be uh, pretty much guaranteed to win the regatta or be in the on the podium. Here, you've got to be top three. Oh, for sure. The the boat that that wins the event's going to average, you know, between three and four most likely of the, yeah. on their scoreline. So. Uh, you really can't push yourself too hard to pass every single boat. Um, well, that's right, but you but can't at the same to time, back and yeah, just so be consistent or just be sitting thinking, okay, I'm fourth. So you, you might be pushing for the third. Right, well, and the difference with this fleet is that, you know, compared to many of the viewers fleet, yeah. who might sail in bigger fleets, uh, you know, you aren't afraid to really punish the one boat that's right behind you yeah. because they're the only threat, you know. Uh, whereas in other f bigger fleets with more separation, you might have more boats very far away, you're kind of more worried about, so you're not going to just tack right on somebody and you're going to sail more of your own race. In this fleet, it's a little bit more of like a sort of a match race environment where as they get separated, you know, it's all about pushing the other boats around you back and trying to extend your lead as much as possible. But over 100 meters then for Azura just now, Jen, they're looking pretty good. Yeah, they are looking good. I'm actually surprised they did those couple of tacks in the middle of the race course. I think they just kind of put a uh, covering tack on Quantum, which was maybe unnecessary, but maybe it makes you feel better. <laughs> Sometimes it's it makes you feel better to do something than to do nothing at all. And I think exactly. when you're not totally sure about the right side, that's really, you might as well go, all right, we'll do one covering tack in the middle just to make sure. But it's as, it's as Terry Hutchison would say, double check the triple check. Belt and braces. <laughs> It's like when you're on a highway that's going slow and you go, should I just get off and go through all the streets, back streets or, or should we just get stuck in this traffic on the highway and you get off to do the back streets and it's totally exactly. the wrong decision. But you feel like you've made a decision. I mean, here I think they could have just extended more and more by never sacrificing those tacks in the middle. But yeah, it makes you feel more confident. It doesn't look like they've lost. I mean, I do think they've probably still put some meters on quantum racing. Oh, the, the motorboat has just stopped for about the first time this entire race, so I can take my... Pretty off, you guys. It is so wet out here for oh. for whatever the audience is watching the racing. And your nice dry insides. We are uh, all wrapped up, hoods on, uh, trying to keep this microphone and phone dry so we could stay in in contact with you. And I think, yeah, for the sailors, yes. maybe it's easier. They have some height height between themselves in the way. Of We're sitting here with our coffees and a pastel donata. <laughs> so anyway. I mean, you're have one really gone off the last <laughs> night. That is what Portugal is to for. I was like, hello, welcome to Portugal, and here we go with the first night. I exactly. Mean, guys, it's not actually kicking up as windy as, as we thought. Yeah, I we're think when we thought, we, yeah, we got out here that it would be right quickly in the 20s, and it felt still, still, still about the same, maybe 18 knots, maybe 17. We know it was a uh, 325 wind direction was what this course was actually set for in the end. So um, a little bit of oscillation between that 330, but um, mostly the fleet's just playing this right this right corner, and I think Azura's probably packed on what's relatively an easy ley line. We're a bit farther from the top mark still, and we are uh, heading back towards it now at pace once again. So if we lose you guys, apologies, but I think it does look like Azura and Quantum sort of starting to leg out a bit on the fleet. The question is probably between Platoon, Allegra, and Slack for this third place position, and they're all sort of picking different ways to go. Sled coming more towards us, middle left. A platoon headed up the middle. And I think the three of us would probably agree that perhaps Allegri on the far right is going to be in the strongest 
position and, and for that to in there as well. So it's a really, really good uh, four horse battle for this third place and I don't think that's an easy battle to follow actually at this moment. Yeah, we'll certainly see what happens. I mean, we're seeing, going to see the same picture all week uh, with a couple of boats sort of stacked on ley line and maybe a boat or two below them trying to gain speed by staying in clear air. Um, but, you know, it, the, the, question, the difficulty is, and you see in Azura here, like you said, Jenny, it's hard to tell if they're on ley line. They've got a box that their, their navigator checks in, like a computer, that tells them when they're on ley line, but it's not the most accurate thing ever. Uh, they've got pings on the windward mark and everything, and, and they've got wind direction. They can sort of calculate it out right there on the boat. Uh, but things change, yeah. um, and so it's difficult for them to call ley line knowing that there's going to be continually more right shift as they go up. Um, so oftentimes yeah, so you'll see them yeah. underlay to make sure that they don't overlay because two tacks is worth maybe three but boat lengths, uh, but overlaying is, by more than yeah. that is... I mean, this is typical of here. That is always the equation. That's always what you're trying to solve. Similarly in Palma, you know, in a right hand or a left side track in Palma, you go under the ley line, everybody lifts above you, and uh, and uh, in the lifting breeze, it's just hard to call that ley line. Anyway, here's a a question for uh, for you, Nick. <laughs> Who would you say is the best helmsman in the series at the moment? Oh, that's a really good question. I think <laughs> you'd you'd probably have to divide that into pro drivers and uh, and. And then the owner drivers, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, and then you can probably see that this, this world will show that uh, certainly there are more experienced owner drivers than not. Uh, Harm has done a very good job as an owner driver. He's, he's quite a good sailor. Um, so is, but, but equally, so is Takashi Akura and... Oh, uh, for sure. There are many, I mean, Soriano all good, and, all and good sailors uh, here. And Eduardo de Souza Ramos has been to two Olympics in his own right. Right. But, um, uh, you know, I think it, for me, it... The driving is only the most important part is whether you can uh, take the input from your crew and execute on it. And That's we've seen right. Platoon do that over and over again, fight through the fleet, get, go really fast at times. Um, and so, you know, a lot of credit to that boat for that, for that driving. Um, and I'm not sure. The, the pro driver, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, certainly the Lunarosa guys have done quite well. Yeah. Um, but you also look at Dean Barker on Quantum, uh, you know, coming up. I don't know how much 52 experience he has, but this is certainly his first year with them. Um, so we'll see how he does. But they've been, um, they've been doing quite well winning the overall series. So maybe that's your answer. What do you think, Jenny? Who's the best helmsman in the fleet? <laughs> this is a fun question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. He does, he does have 52... Uh, 52 seasons in itself, Dean Barker, from the top. And then of course, the yeah, I mean, D D Dean, go yeah. <coughs> the Dean goes right back with 50, the 52s, right back to uh, 2006. With, back when uh, New Zealand had with, a team. With Warpath and then won it twice with Team New Zealand. He sailed with Brebon, he sailed with uh, lots of different boats in the fleet over the, uh, over the years. Exactly, exactly. So I think it's I think it's neat to see him come in and, and remember how to sail the boat and especially, you know, with with um, different team members, different crew. The on the dock today, Cooper Dressler, the the young guy on their um, boat, one of the big grinders who's also with them on American Magic was saying how cool it was yesterday to to see the communication between Dean and their Kimmer Tito on the downwind. He was like it was just fabulous. They were so good. And again he was talking about the surf yesterday, which is a bit different to today, sort of skipping over the top of the waves, but I was asking, like, how long does each surf last, and if it's between 5 and 10 seconds, were you guys eking it out closer to 10 when other teams were dropping off more at, say, 5? And he was like, you know, I'm not sure if we were if we were lasting longer or the surfs were staying longer than other teams, but we didn't miss a single wave. And I think that is probably, when we talk about the... What Nick was saying about the, own, the driver being able to, to listen to the crew. Because it's not just the technician. The technician says where to go. On the upwind, the main sheet trimmer sort of says how to drive. And on the downwind, the, the spinnaker trimmer sort of says how to drive. So the, tech, the, the driver themselves is getting all this input from all these other, other people. And then at the same time, their own, their own feeling of the helm and especially the tiller on the majority of these boats. Actually, all the boats because Gladiator's not here. So... They have to be able to really multitask, even if they're not aware that they're multitasking. Um, I mean, it's, unfortunately, we don't have a female driver this week, but we did last regatta, and 
to talk about multitasking with females being good at that. They were winning <laughs> against the last day. So I don't Steady know. on. Let's Maybe not go there. To it, you know? But anyway, so as, we, as we're chatting away, rounding the top mark here and definitely having extended their lead from the bottom mark into this moment is Azura, and they are happily flying towards the offset mark right now. Um, Spinnaker coming out on the bow. Guillermo Parada and Santiago Longe trying to iron out the kinks in their tactician driver new relationship, but they are doing so in fine form this afternoon. And if you can see behind them the distinctive sea breeze sort of over the mountains of what's basically Lisbon behind Cascais and Azura just sailing away from it beautifully. A little bit late, perhaps, on the setting of the kite, um, but the kite is filling and it looks like it'll be fun. I think we might expect another early jibe, though not a jibe set, because it's much easier to... Actually, it wasn't a great set. Their kite is still flogging a bit longer, um, but behind is there a, a long distance back just round in the top mark here. It's Quantum Racing for second place, so we were just and talking about close. Steve Archer, how he's remembering to, to steer the boat. He wasn't steering at the last event, Doug DeVos was, so again, he's stepping back on board and, and remembering even just from the first regatta till now, but they won the practice race yesterday, as you guys know, and as the viewers probably know, and they, they did beautifully in that last downwind going from fifth to second. So I think we could perhaps see them um, make some gains. But see. Behind them then, Allegra into third position. So we we were making that question of those four boats, which one would pay off, and we said probably the right. And I think, oh, uh, is it Allegra, though, or is it a white boat? No, it's fled. So it wasn't the right boat. It was the furthest left boat of that close pack of four. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Akura pulling out from the left for the second upwind. They also made the left play a bit on the first upwind as well. Behind them, Provetta and happily and maybe shockingly, Onda has stepped up eighth place earlier into uh, now a fifth place position. So good on Onda. I don't even remember where they necessarily but maybe they're feeling comfortable with their Portuguese-speaking team, <laughs> even if they're from Brazil and not Portugal, and they kind of played a little local flavor somehow there. And catching up, we'll have to take a look back at the tracker to see where they went and then what happened to Platoon, because they were all the way up to third, and now they've dropped all the way back to seventh again. So we um, we uh, are seeing a very, very tight battle here. Platoon about to get rolled by Allegra. So Allegra also dropped back hard. In that, in that battle, they were in that fight for third, and they're now in seventh, just rolling over the top of platoon. I'm going to I'm gonna say nobody has jived yet. I'm going to say this will be all about when to time this first jive and whether they only do one jive to the finish. I think with nobody jiving here, maybe they're in a touch of a, uh, of a left shift. In fact, sorry, Azura has jived way up in the front. But I would sort of expect platoon and even Onda to jive soon because Onda's getting rolled. Onda, in fact, kite is flogging. They just went from what was fifth to the kite still flogging. So they need some real muscle power on board that boat to get it back under control. And they've just gotten it under, under control there. But that was a big mistake by um, a team we were just talking about earlier, a relatively new team to the series this year. A lot of Olympic talent on board, even just in Robert Schein himself with numerous Olympic medals. But they've been trying to learn how to get it all going. And they had a fabulous first event. I think finishing third or fourth, Andy, you have to check for me, but I remember talking to Eduardo Ramos saying, he said just to get to play here amongst these guys, I told the team was a trophy in itself, and to be doing nearly as well as we are, it's, it's shocking, so That's right. really uh, amazing for us to away here. Indeed, they were second in their first race uh, together as a team back in the uh, Sibonik, but uh, were not so good uh, in Zadar, finishing uh, in ninth, I think, started very badly there with a the 10th and 11th, but uh, had a few good races in Zadar, but I think this is much more the kind of conditions they enjoy. Of course, Robert Scheidt, nine uh, Laser World Championship wins, and he's sailed here many, many times <coughs> over the years. Certainly knows his way around the race course uh, here in Cascais. Looking at the bow of Platoon just now, Platoon, uh, as you said, Jen, dropping to seventh. The uh, world champions, not quite sure what happened on that second beat. to a race number one of the TP52 World Championship. Alongside Harmler Spear. Dirk de Ridder on the uh, main sheet, looking pretty relaxed. Working with Harm down that run. 
This is the second run coming down to the finish and uh, Azura are leading by uh, quite a long way. Yeah, well, Jenny, I, I think a lot of the reason that most of these boats haven't jived is because they never had the opportunity. I mean, it was such a close rounding uh, that, you know, if you didn't have the perfect set and didn't extend that little bit, then if, as you try to jive, the boat behind is just going to stick the nose down and, and keep you from driving. Uh-oh. Oh, there's a kite lost on the uh, on sled. Yeah, we see it. We saw Quantum go for a drive, and it was quite slow, quite long down a wave. And it, then their kite took a while to fill, and yet they stayed in second. So we've been watching very closely the rest of the pack drive and whether or not they could pull it off nicely on a wave, or it would be a little bit slower like Quantum's. And sleds just, the kite just ripped in the middle of the drive. It wasn't even, it didn't look to be caught on anything. It might have just filled kind of at an in unfortunate time. I think that's going to be a huge um, disastrous loss for Sled, what would have been maybe even third place for them. They'll be dropping through the fleet. They've gathered it quickly, but to be able to bring the next Seneca up and get the next Seneca flying, they should probably at least lose four or five votes there, go from third to possibly eighth, unfortunately, for, for Sled. We're on board, or pretty feels like we're on board with uh, with Platoon Nick, doesn't it? It's just incredible images. Oh. So we're seeing a Harmler Spear. On yeah, the I mean, the but all the crew trying basically hiking off the back, the you know back lifeline that's trying to get the bow out of the water. In the meantime, Azura over 450 meters ahead, and uh, we're seeing Onda up to third gen, according to Virtual Eye. Yeah, and I think Miguel Onda's going to have to drive one more time, so that's the unfortunate task of driving early. Is needing to put in a second drive, and as we were saying earlier, these boats are ripping so fast right now that about the only thing they do slowly is, is the drive until they get back up to speed. And if, and if um, the other two boats, Platoon, uh, can actually finish without having to drive one more time, they should make <laughs> some gains on Honda. We are trying to get down the course right now towards the leaders of Zero. I think there's probably no way we can cut them to them. They're going much faster than our little bird can take. Yeah, well, it looks like uh, Prevetsa and Allegra are driving, you know, very close to the finish lay line. Platoon maybe even overlaying by a little bit. That could be a loss for them. So we'll see what, what happens to the virtual. For sure, having to throw another jibe in, the boat speed drops about half of what they do uh, while they're on that plane, for sure. Jibing is not, not very fast, so you have to have a really big reason to do so. I think getting across the finish line is, <laughs> <laughs> is a good reason, isn't it? Well, for sure, but yeah. doing two extra ones is uh, you no, know tough completely. sometimes. But for sure, if we could, uh, if Onda could hang on to this, that would be a big boost to their confidence after the uh, last regatta in Shibenik. There's a lot of pressure there in that little group with uh, Provetsa and Allegra. Phoenix catching up just a little bit, getting back into the mix. And Sled have lost right out with that uh, kite rip. Nice shots from overhead with the uh, platoon ripping down this right side, looking downwind. Second run of uh, race number one of the Rolex TP50 World, Ch 52 World Championships here in uh, Cascais. Yeah, well, for sure, this downwind's all about speed. And like we said earlier, you know, it's just communication between the kite trimmers and the drivers. Uh, there's a lot of it, and, and basically, as the breeze picks up, it's almost less about surfing waves. Like yesterday during the practice race, the breeze was three or four knots lighter, and it, and it was a surfing condition most of the time. But now all the boats are planning. It's actually about not crashing into the wave in front of you as you go so fast that you're going over them. Um, and so trying to keep the bow out of the water with all the crew in the back there and knowing when to put the bow up a little bit to, to, to gain some speed again or just to skip that bow right over the, the next wave in front um, or when to put the boat down and gain some VMG. Um, you know, good question. Just watching uh, Grant Lorette's the trimmer on uh, Azura. Well, they've crossed the line now, huh? Just about, I think. I think yeah, there they are. Just watching Azura coming through the finish, Jenny. <laughs> Uh, a beautiful comeback on that first downwind for Quantum Racing and able to hold off 
nicely on the downwinds. And I think, as you guys can see, these two boats have really put the pedal down compared to the rest of the pack behind them. It's another probably 200 meters or so till the next boats come into vision. And who's and that going to be? What we're gonna, it looks like Allegra at the moment is, is going to be bow forward here, but it is very tight between Allegra and Platoon. So the two silver boats, the two gray boats, fighting for who's going to get into the bottom marks here. One of them earlier had rolled over the top of Provenza, which is why Provenza dropped back. But now we've got a little starboard port battle here, and it's Allegra bearing away, trying to drive in front of Platoon, driving in front of Platoon, in fact. But Platoon going over the top of them, she's going to roll over the top. And whether they can do it at the gun before the marks, it looks like they will by about half a foot. So Platoon just rips into third place over Allegra. That was spectacular um, boat handling and tactical decision making. Green flag from the Empire. So all clear there. And it was Provenza just coming in just behind them. Not quite as close behind those guys here for Phoenix, but Phoenix instead nipping just in front of Onda. And unfortunately for Sled, lost out massively on that downwind. So Sled rounding out a very, very tight battle for um, nine boats. But apologies, only eight boats racing there because Luna Russa had dropped out early on due to some problems with their jibs. So Crossing the line for eighth position, Sled went from whew, much higher up, I think maybe even third or fourth, to, to an eighth. And I think you guys, we can see that the racing is never over so close. until the downwinds are over because those are some exceptional um, position changes and place changes all through the fleet. Actually, at the top marks as well, um, that, that last top mark where Onda went from about ninth to about third was pretty impressive. We'll have to go back and look at virtual eye as to how how some of those position changes happen. But I think the thing we could take away as sailors and, and as ourselves as commentators is just what are they doing on the downwinds that's so successful to move through the fleet. I think that'll be great to ask some of these guys on land as well. And it might just be it might just be the difference between catching two good waves or two good surf or having one great dive if the other if the other boats don't have a great dive. Ah, sled had that was the problem with sled was they ripped their kite. So that's I just remember that so I got a little <laughs> I'm excited with them, and it's like being so close. Forgot about the Japanese team, the U.S. Japanese team suffering on that downwind. But, you know, I think that can happen with, with everyone here. As we've seen, Luna Rosa, who won the last event in Croatia, they suffered a malfunction almost on the start line, so didn't even get to race. So keeping in mind for everyone here, there are no throwouts. This is going to be a regatta till the very end, and for people to have deep scores already at the beginning is, a, is an interesting task. Indeed, Jenny. Uh, Nick, what do you think of that win for Azura then? Yeah, well, I think you're going to see Azura, Quantum, Platoon, and Lunarosa when they get back into the race, you know, in the top five almost every race here. It's certainly like a. I mean, <laughs> that's I, a bold. It's a bold <laughs> statement, but if you. It, but with. It's, it's, it's the. A, a, it's these the, are the conditions. They the, are the teams with the experience. For the, sure. Uh, and these downwinds, like we're saying, and making a big gain on the downwinds by being faster. Uh, and just the, the drivers with, you know. 10 times more experience are going to be able to do that much more consistently than the other boats. Yeah. Um, and if they can just get, I mean, you saw platoon rounding the, the, the top mark way behind. If they were in front, yeah. think about where they would have been in the race. So that's our uh, race number one of the Rolex TP52 World Championship here in Kaskai. So the winners are Azura, second Quantum Racing, third platoon, uh, Allegra fourth, Provetza fifth, Phoenix sixth, Onda in seventh, uh, Sled in eighth after that uh, tight tight, uh, sorry, kite break, and a Luna Rossa who had to retire after the, uh, or before the start pretty much, he had a hydraulic problem which we believe is uh, sorted out and we will see them out for the, uh, for the second race. But uh, Zura there with a nice uh, confidence building w win, the way they want to go into this uh, World Championship uh, after such a slightly disappointing start to their season. And uh, really good conditions, Nick, that's what we came for, isn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's great to see the boats out there ripping along and even the kites tearing in half and things like that. It's, uh, it's too bad to see the equipment break, but um, definitely, definitely good to see some action out there and Absolutely. good to see the boats going fast. So the uh, action will continue with race number two here at the Rolex TP52 World Championships. Join us again in a few minutes uh, when we are back live in Cascais.
Welcome back to Breezy Cascais. We're going straight on to the water for race number two of this Rolex TP52 World Championship. Azura just winning the uh, first race of the day and uh, winning it quite conclusively. We're just at uh, just on one minute to uh, the start of race number two uh, and things shaping up nicely on the start line with Jenny Tullock, I hope. Absolutely, and we had a boat out of the running in the last race. They had a hydraulic issue, but they are just in front of me here. Luna Rosa, the winners of the last regatta in Zadar in Croatia. They are wanting to pin in for this start. So a little bit different than the last start that we saw where everybody was crowded at the boat. Perhaps the pin is a little bit favored now. It looks like it's definitely upwind of the boat trying to spread the fleet a little bit here. 30 seconds to go to the start. Prada definitely stamping the fact that they want this pennant. Also, they didn't race in the last race, so maybe they don't know how strong the right was. But looking up the pack a little bit, you can see Phoenix punched out in the middle of the line. Actually, they're so punched out, it's hard to see above them. With just 12 seconds to go, Prada putting their bow down. Quantum in the leeward middle of the line. Azura just behind Quantum. Azura might be late to the start here. In fact, 2 one there's the gun. Luna Rosa just putting their bow up now. Really nice pennant start for those guys. Middle of the pack. Quanta racing just to leeward of Azura, who was able to pull the trigger in the end. And then I can't actually see up the line from there. But definitely Onda has been left a little bit in the dust here by Luna Rosa at the pennant of the line. As well, it looks like maybe Azura, not the best start that they wanted. Above Quantum Racing is Phoenix in the middle. And then out to the right. It looks like Sled, Platoon, Allegre, um, all digging it out. Nobody has packed off yet. Jen, not such a good start uh, for uh, Azura by the looks of things. Not quite getting off the yeah, line as well. We, yeah, we called that about uh, 10 seconds to go. They weren't really accelerating and they weren't really in the right position for a start. Maybe they had a last second decision to come down to the pin end. Maybe they thought the right would be so favored and the boat would be so favored because last race it was. And instead, it looks like the pen was really pulled upwind a little bit here. So whether we have a last second left ship or we have the race ready to decide to favor the pen since the race course is quite right favored. But I think maybe they just they weren't quite in the right position and then decided um, late to come down and didn't ever really execute forward enough. So, yeah, they're very much being rolled by Quantum Racing here. And they unfortunately don't have any distance to tack out um, because the, the fleet's so stacked up outside of them. So... It's going to be a little while before we see the majority of the fleet pack. I think one boat has just gone on to port. I can't see if it's Allegra or Platoon from here um, quite far away, but they had had a bad start already. So we'll see if they're able to make the right side pay. Surprisingly, uh, Sled's also tacked out way off to the right as well. Um, but surprisingly here, the rest of the fleet still staying on port tack for, for much longer than they did in the last race. Yeah, Nick, what do you think? A good start from Quantum... Uh and as Jenny said, uh, Luna Rossa picking that pin end seemed to keep the bow down, really build speed quite nicely coming into the start. Sitting a little bit lower early on, clearly looking to try and get something on this left to get back into the right, I think. Yeah, well, something uh, changed. There's got to be a bit of a bias to the pin end. Maybe the race committee deciding that they didn't like that everyone was just going to the yeah. right lay line there. So they tried to make it a bit of an, more of an open race course. Um, but you'll certainly see all these boats flopping over to the right side again. So the question is going to be whether Luna Rosa's Quantum's, you know, pin and bias is going to take them all the way to the leading position at the mark, or if boats like Sled and Platoon are going to gain on that right side uh, as they come up the course. I'm not sure. Azura not quite as, start, as uh, sharp off that start line, getting sandwiched between uh, Quantum and Phoenix, really. Yeah, a little bit of a tough situation for them, and it's definitely, you know, the crowded end of the line ended up being the pin, which I think was probably surprising for some of these teams. Um, so, you know, maybe not exactly what they expected, uh, but definitely when the breeze comes up, and it seems even windier, and Jelly, Jenny, you can confirm this, but, the, you know, all the teams have gone down a code in the jib, um, and so it, it does seem quite windy. Um, and s and when, it, when, when the breeze comes up, y you drift down the line much more, and it's a lot harder to hold your spot. Uh, so in order to line up early enough, the boats are going to end up further towards the pin if they, if they all jockey for position early, you know, a minute 32 minutes on. Uh, but you can see the, the dynamics and the angles of the boats off the start line as well. I mean, very much Prada and the boats at the pin where the rest will bow down to them. So that's either a left shift or the pin being favored. That's not necessarily just the drifting down the line because it's too windy. It is 
it is much, well, not much, but relative. It is windier now, <laughs> for sure, as, as we bump up this race course. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you can see the teams are already hiking their hardest in the last in the last races as well. So it is now about peak power. I'm going to say that one more. First tail to go that's smaller than the then they go that way, and they start to really peak power the mains. I mean, not a single wrinkle in these mains. You can see, uh, well, I'm looking at, at Lunarosa and on the here. I'm not sure what you got to see, but very much so. It looks like Lunarosa has got their main tail more settled. So Ondo hasn't quite figured out the right trim to get the perfect twist off the top of the sail. So instead, you can see their top of their main inverting every now and then, the, the top, um, well, the leak essentially flicking as well, whereas Prada dragging and, and pulling all the time. So Prada's got a really nice setup here, and this, this is the first time we're seeing them sail up right now, because they had their issue on the first uh, race, they, they weren't able to compete. I think they, said, they told us they had a hydraulic issue, and they've been able to fix it during the racing. I think you can see they're, they're racing just fine here. So you guys asked about earlier, but that'll be the question. Was their pit at start enough to overcome what will later on be a right-side favor and a right-side shift? Or will maybe Sled um, start further up the track, which was a bit further behind, but allow them to tack off first? Will that be will that be the winning move? And I'm sure for Ray Davies, the technician on board Sled, that's what they're going to be hoping for, because they were really doing nicely last race in that third place until their Spinnaker split. I think they're going to be um, out here rearing to go, trying to, to prove that they they can be. They, they've been only bowed to be on the podium in both of the first two regattas so far this season. So they they can be on the podium. They would like to be again. And, of course, I'm sure everyone out here would like to win as well. Yeah, so Luna Ross on this left side, going pretty well. Huge amount of talent on board the uh, Luna Rossa. Vasco Vascotto is the uh, tactician this year. We saw uh, Jimmy Spithill just in the uh, pre-start, just across the start line. He's in the white, just at the back of the boat. Uh, and uh, Francesco Bruni steering. Yeah, so Jenny, your, your point about you, just this shot with the mains and the, certainly the, the main on Onda is, is, is a little bit more shaky. There's a bunch of things that can go into that. You know, the amount of backside that they have, maybe their jib is trimmed slightly tighter and you've got some some backflow over the slot there that's sort of given that backwind, or maybe the mass bend is slightly different just based on the properties of the mass itself, or maybe their you know, shroud tensions are different. I'm not sure if you adjust those in these boats. Um, but there's lots that's going on and lots of dynamics that go into that, and it's uh, oftentimes difficult to fix when you're on board uh, to look up and say there's something wrong, but you're not sure what to fix because there's 25 controls that make a difference on these boats. So it's, uh, it's all a balance with them and, um, you know, that's why there's 15 people on the boat to try and figure it out. So we're looking at uh, the achievements of uh, Guillermo Parada on the uh, Azura. Who knew, who knew that uh, Guillermo has been to the uh, the Olympics for uh, for Argentina and uh, three twice uh, TP52 World Champion and three times uh, 52 Super Series Champion. An ex-470 uh, racer, but a very long string of uh, successes. And I think, uh, didn't he win the Cadet World Championship when he was very young? That's uh, Guillermo Parada on the uh, Azura. Yeah, well, certainly a, a long list of achievements in the, the you know, high finishes, the Snipe Worlds and the J24 Sort of 40 is, uh, Worlds, didn't yeah, he? There's some pretty, pretty tactical racing in those fleets for sure, so... He's going to have some strength in there, and you're probably going to see them execute quite well on the uh, some of the difficult maneuvers. And very much the uh, kingpin of this uh, of this team, skipper of the uh, Azura, has been in this fleet uh, for a good eight or nine years, I think now for uh, Azura and uh, Matador. Before that, won the World Championships in uh, 2009, I think it was in. Uh, in Palma with Matador, and then changed, uh, took on the uh, emblematic colours of the Yacht Club Costa Esmeralda with the Zura and the Romers family's members uh, and uh, big supporters of the Yacht Club. I'm talking of uh, Luna Rossa out on this left side, battling with uh, Onda. And of course, back in 2010, the last time that Luna Rossa had a 52 running, then uh, 
Robert Scheich was uh, on board, did a season with, uh, with Luna Rossa. It's a nice onboard shot. Looking down, you see probably what the, uh, if, a, if a VIP or a guest was on there, that'd be, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be the, what they were looking at. Um, but, you know, all these boats just marching their way towards that starboard tack ley line, trying to position themselves to play the game. And, you know, Quantum, with their good start and they're going quite fast, you know, they put, a, put about a length on everybody there. It's going to mean, you know, very, very easy decisions for them if they're going to be able to cross those starboard boats coming back and they just sort of can extend from there if that's, well, we if are that's seeing the case. Our virtual is showing us that uh, Sled and Allegra, I think uh, the first boats to get out to the right, along yeah. with Pavetsa, seem to have the uh, early advantage, just looking at it now in virtual. Yeah, we'll see, you know, we'll see as that comes together yeah. that, you know, the virtual can be off sometimes by a little bit, but I wouldn't be surprised to see those guys gaining quite a bit. And that was the question is, you know, as they favor that pin end, then do you take the line bias knowing that you're going to gain two or three boat lengths right away? Yeah. Uh, and how many boat lengths are you going to gain as you get towards the right side? And the, the depending on what the leverage is and how the fleet pans out, it can be totally different. Um, and so maybe a three boat length gain at the pin, but a five boat length gain by being the rightmost boat means that the rightmost boat gains by two boat exactly. lengths. And so We're that's what we to find that out in the next few minutes, aren't we? <laughs> right. But that's what all the strategists and tacticians are trying to decide, um, you know, is what, what works. And certainly if you know you're fast, the safe move is to take the line bias. Yeah. Um, I knowing that you're I mean, already going to uh, yeah. gain that way. And that's an interesting point because uh, Luna Ross have sailed less than most of the other teams in the, uh, in the fleet. Well, Vasco obviously knows uh, knows the fleet, but doesn't know his boat as well. That's but true, but I will say, over my few years of watching the series, oh, Vasco loves to start at the pin. No, he does absolutely. So and we've so uh, <laughs> and, uh, not all that surprising to see them winning the pin down there. They're, they're generally yeah. unchallenged when he's uh, in charge of the boat. We down saw there. that quite often in uh, in Zadar. In fact, there was one or two culprits or uh, shall we say boats which favored that the the pin end there and he was one and sled was uh, one of the others so yes. as you're looking jenny we're just watching uh, luna rossa coming back from this left side still with uh, onda yeah and i would say it's definitely going to be a right favor here i mean it looks to me like sled should be crossing this entire pack I think outside Sled, if that's Allegra who went a bit further along, that'll be the only competition for Sled yet. And in fact, you're looking for Lunaressa here. She's gone for the lead out underneath Azura, and they're kind of, they're almost, I would call it a leaster, and I don't, I don't want to call that to them, but that's what it looks like. It's last, a leap and a decision to, to not keep crossing, to hope for maybe one more piece of left side favor later on at the course. And I think for sure that was it. It was Sled being able to get early and out to the right and to, be able to, to take advantage of being the first to the three shift has made them um, at least top two. I'm not sure if they're actually leading. If it's Allegra who's furthest out to their right, it might be Allegra leading. It just continues to look like the right shift is bending this lead further and further right, and, the, and Scarborough Tuck is getting more and more lifted. So that'll keep going the way of, of the gray boat Allegra if, that's, um, if it stays. As they come out to the top mark, though, it could come back a tiniest bit more left and that would then favor sled for the one in position. But I think probably that's what Luna was just hoping for. It's a tiny bit more of a lefty once they sail away from the headlines and to be able to kind of execute on that. And we saw it work on the last up when we saw that work for sled. Well, the five boats behind them or four boats behind them passed with each other. Uh, sled made a small game middle, left, right at the very end and were able to capitalize on that on both of the up ones. So... It's not all over for Lunarosa, but it, it's not looking good after such a great start. Yeah, well, that's the risk of being out on the left side, is that if you just don't quite cross all those starboard boats, then suddenly you're ducking the entire fleet, um, and there's not really a whole lot of options back. So it's a risk, and it's challenging, and uh, that, that's the decision that people have to make. And, and certainly, you know, making a decision eight minutes before it's going the you know the results of it are going to be shown on on the water is is tough it's very difficult to do indeed so we're just seeing these races are a little bit little bit shorter and sharper than uh, we've seen this season around about 45 minutes as opposed to normally we're just on the hour for the uh, two up wins two down wins so good nice uh, overhead view on the virtual just now looking at uh, 
Allegra quite nicely positioned out closest towards the uh, starboard tack lay line. Sled, uh, sled's position solid just now, but uh, yeah, well, that's that's the challenge, right? If you're a sled and you're not on ley line here, then if you wait long enough and you aren't crossing Quantum or you aren't crossing Allegra and you let these boats to lure of you tack and get over to that right ley line, then there might not be space for you. So if, if you're in sled's position, you're looking over your shoulder going, when are we go? going to cross Quantum? And yeah. if we are, we can wait here. And if we're not, maybe we should go and just set ourselves up to take take third place, yeah. you know, and as opposed to pushing forward for the first, which could turn into an eighth or a ninth, yeah. uh, you know, as these ley lines come together. Especially in this fleet. Oh, it's no space at the top, but you saw that even at the at, at the second mark in the so last we're race. On board with Luna Rossa as the attack. Yeah. We were talking earlier about how their main trim looks better than Onda's, but in fact, they didn't actually ever pull away from Onda. I almost think Onda ended up looking better out of mm. that two-boat test. And then just now, we saw them sort of do the lee stern here to Azura and Provenza, but even then, they were sailing a much wider angle than Azura, and granted, because they'd sort of put themselves in a bad position. We did, uh, we did wonder about them coming off the line like that, you know? They seemed to be quite bowed down off the line, whether that was just dragging out to the left earlier, whether they just didn't have the height. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be hard getting used to Completely. having all race that first race, so you don't have those two upwinds. So getting used to for the trimmers and the driver, just the waves and the conditions here. Yes, they had the practice race yesterday, but it's a whole new day and the yeah. rest of the eight yeah, boats have been yesterday was 12 to 15. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yesterday <laughs> was a much different condition. <laughs> So there's sled crossing quantum. So they obviously, you know, made the right decision to wait, uh, you know, crossing ahead and and a little bit of, you know, less risk for them. They're probably going to see a duck on Allegra unless they think they're on ley line, in which case they'll leave out. Here they go. Just going to leave out. So they must be. They must think they're on ley line because that's a risky call if they're not. Um, and it's, so it's going to be really interesting to see how these the rest of these boats line <laughs> up. If uh, if Azura and can fit through there and Quantum can cross these starboard exactly. boats, then it's going to be you know a bit of a more simple picture. But it's definitely going to be a fight over there. That's right. Quantum need to control well, this, this group, like don't they? Time, if you have a really long starboard tack left to go and a very short port tack to the lay line, you always prefer the lee bow. You'd always think. If I can just hurt them a little bit, then they'll tack off. Then I tack again, and I have the leave out again. But if I go for the big duck, I'm giving I'm giving away distance to boat length, and I'm definitely giving them the lead. So I think, yeah, we have a, a much longer server tack here, only a very short port tack. The sled, and they did just that. They leave out. They hurt Allegra enough that Allegra went for the tack. Surprisingly, sled did not go with them. So now sled's got a really difficult, now is a hard time, yeah. uh, whether they can actually make this line themselves or whether they go for a really short double tack with Allegra up to speed. I sort of expected them to go with Allegra when Allegra attacked, even wait a boat length or so, but then go with. Um, but now they put themselves in, in a more precarious position. And maybe it was just because they kind of got a right shift right at the end and they actually thought they could lay it on their own without having to double tack. Um, that would be a, a mini miracle, but perhaps it's it's reading these mini miracles coming up since they had um since, since they have the bummer of the of the kite break last time. It does look like this righty that they just got right when Allegra attacked is, is holding for now. It looks like Sled will be able to um pull off. Yeah, you can see the boats yeah, above them pressing down. Able to pull it off. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, but it certainly would have been a risky move if they weren't laying, because if the other guys are able to hold on their hip, then they're really in trouble, and they c get to the top mark and can't tack. They're going to have to end up ducking the entire fleet, which is n usually not worth trying to push for that first place spot. But here they go, attacking. Wow, so they really didn't lay. This might be, uh, you know, this is going to be a close situation here. Those other boats, wow, they're doing all right there. The, the, the trick is with the other boats, when they're high and pressing down, it ends up being okay. Um, you know, the, the, the risk is that they break 18.3, which is having, and I don't know if that's, a, if that's a rule that exists in this class, but it's if you tack inside the three-length zone, you can't force the boat to windward of you to go past what their proper course would be upwind, which is a close hauled course. Otherwise, you're going to get a penalty. So, um, you know, risky move there by sled, uh, but, you know, we'll see if it pays off. Maybe they are a bit frustrated by their kite, you know, going down and want to get their average back up. Anyway, uh, 
Then uh, Sled leading round the top mark. Allegra second. Looks like Quantum third, Jenny. Quantum racing, yes. I'm caught into third. Prevetsa in fourth. Behind Prevetsa, it looks like Azura and Platoon very, very tightly fighting for fifth place. Then Onda Phoenix. Maybe there's some boats in there that I can't see because that's definitely not nine. That only sounds like about seven. But Sled, no, no fouls, no penalties there from the three Empire boats that are watching that quite closely. It's Sled actually extended to almost a boat-length lead here in front of Allegra. So a great final decision-making and top mark rounding for Sled, uh, the team that was last on the water in the last regatta, just filling their kite not beautifully. So they're kite struggling, wrapped around the jib, and they've got it out now. So Sled lost a little bit there, but rounding, holding on to their first just, just barely now, with Allegra behind them in second. Quantum racing, bow three into third, behind Quantum Azura, First boat to drive, they've gone for the drive set, which is fair enough because just outside them was three boats very close with Preventa, then Platoon, then Luna Rosa, and then just after them is Onda and Phoenix. So the last two boats to round the mark were the same as the last two on the, on the previous race, but we did see them both move up through the fleet at points in the race. Luna Rosa did not come out of the pin looking very good. We talked about maybe that was from the left side not paying, and maybe it was from there speed up with struggling a bit, but Lunarissa will be the second boat to drive, so that's the two Italian teams driving with relatively early drives while everybody else extends on starboard tack here on the downwind. But Azura seemed to be going quite fast and quite a nice angle since they uh, did that early jibe. Yeah, you definitely. Know, last race, how much you can pay to, to separate from the fleet. Platoon did that. They went from a seventh or eighth to second on the, or to third on that first downwind. So maybe Azura trying to move up through the pack even more here. Yeah, good. certainly good to get away, like you know, like you said, Jenny. But also, also good to just get going down the track and maybe maybe a lot of these guys staying on starboard trying to reduce the maneuvers but uh, certainly seemed like a bit of a right shift there at the top so the, the port angle downwind was likely better around the mark. Mm, let's wait and see. Well, certainly these three boats on this uh, right side looking downwind. Sled, Quantum uh, and uh, Allegri. Allegri burying the bow a little bit there just to lure of uh, Quantum. Uh, well, everyone's smoking fast down here. Quantum in a little <laughs> bit of trouble, though, because of the, the you know, ha having to take a high set and being high, they, they can't quite jive. And if they did, even if they could get the cross off, uh, they'd likely just get jived right on top of. So a lot of pressure on Quantum right now to put the bow down and get low so that they have some more options coming back towards the mark. So we'll see how it ends up for them. Tough calls for Terry on the board. Indeed, and great images there. Hiking yeah, off the back of the way They're going to roll over these it? guys here. They were sailing higher and higher, and Sled was trying to sort of protect low, and I think Quantum's basically just been able to roll over the top. So Sled hasn't broken their kite yet. We haven't <laughs> actually seen the kite collapse completely, but Quantum definitely has sort of rolled over the top and into into what could be a commanding, yeah, a, a Sled heading into the drive now. So Sled a little bit accepting defeat there. Maybe they just held off right to the final moment, and they've actually been able to hold to a really good corner, and Quantum's had to wait too long, but... That was a, a tough positioning for Quantum, and they did really well to um, to execute over the top. They're not yeah. driving yet, so it doesn't look like they... No, they're, they're, in, they're in a fantastic band uh, of pressure. I think they're coming down with a gust. Oh, that's a bro... Sled's looking like they're having a bit of an issue. Maybe they can't release their Vang or something. Their main looks uh, very, very full at the top, making them heal over quite a bit more than the other boats, which might account for their Let's just watch Quantum's jibe. Nice, Sled smooth. In their drive as well. Sled came out of the drive too hot, blew their kite racked the kite for a while, got the boat back under the control, but um, <laughs> not a pretty drive for anyone here, it looks like. It's, it's that extra three to three knots of wind that's um, turning I don't think Quantum looked too bad. Well, like we said in the last race, you know, you basically can't turn too slow and fill the kite too far downwind in these boats and this, this much breeze. You're yeah. basically basically killing speed through the jibes intentionally to keep the bow from plowing as you get the kite filled and then have everybody rush towards the back to get the boat planing again. Uh, but it's definitely difficult and uh, everything has to be set up right if you have not quite enough twist in the main or... Oh. In the back of the pack, Prevetsa just got hit by a puff 
rounded up into Onda, essentially. So they've just wiped both of them out. Onda avoided, but both boats flogging their kite part. And it was just a puff that was, instead of, you know, three knots one year, maybe it was five knots one year. And it was um, an unforced error there for Peter Holmberg. But no harm, no foul for either boat, unfortunately. Yeah, this is pretty much your forecast, though, wasn't it? It was going to really build in the uh, in the afternoon. And that's what we're starting to see now. Just looking at uh, Onda there with hardly any bang on at all. Yeah, well, the yeah. boat's definitely just trying to burn power right exactly. now, and they they want to go down the track and have as little speed as they you know as little heel as they can, uh, you know, and maybe boats like Onda Prevetsa are going to be. You know, p potentially overlaying and an overlay in downwind and this much breeze uh, to leeward marks is a, is is really difficult to do a hot drop uh, at the end and a lot of pressure is is, is you Look know. Look at that! Fantastic images of uh, the quantum racing then underwater. <laughs> and we were saying this is where the uh, the pro driver certainly. Yeah, well, even quantum, you know, it's sailing yeah. sailing pretty high here. It looks like to us on the TV. I don't know what you're seeing out there, Jenny, but. Uh, looks like they're pretty hot angle, a lot of heel, and that was really put punching through the waves and uh, maybe a little bit of a compromised situation for them. Yeah. Yeah. And not necessarily compromising situations here, but it is just you can be caught off guard much more easily uh, with, with anything behind them. You maybe don't have a spotter for one second because everyone's coming out of the drive doing their individual tasks and the puff hits. At the moment, I think we've seen that happen now twice, both to Sled and to Prevetsa. We've just seen Azura go through a beautiful drive, in fact. So, um, still not at the front of the pack, kind of in the middle of the pack, but... They don't seem to have gained right anything now, or lost anything down that time. left side. Looks like Prevetsa might have some issues on board. Yeah, they're dropping their kite now. That's Phoenix. No, that's Prevetsa. Oh, yeah. Prevetsa, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe something went wrong with whatever that wind-up was, but they certainly took a big dip down and sort of, you know, everybody off the rail trying to figure that out. So hopefully not too much is broken on their boat. But crazy racing, good, amazing racing out here. Awesome. I mean, this is making me That's jealous of being <laughs> the, of the sailors <laughs> <laughs> sitting here in the studio. I wish I was out of my That's kiteboard or something. That's what we're here for. But but Quantum with a big gain. And Sled certainly not out of it, having uh, had that small problem at the top yeah. of the uh, top of the run, neck and neck with Quantum coming into the uh, leeward gate along with Allegri. So, what's your call in the leeward gate, uh, Jen? <laughs> well, having opened my eyes against the salt water, I think we'll probably see the boats going right again. We've just gotten down here into position and we've got Quantum racing now into the lead. So Quantum dropping their kite and yeah, rounding the right mark, going to the right. Just got past sled, so wasn't quite sure how they did that, but of, of course everyone's going so fast and it's about the dry speed when they've done one. Sled also going for what looks like a right turn, but they're going to have to go quite wide and give room to Allegri. So Allegri moves up into second place. Sled going for a very wide third, if not maybe even tied for third with Azura, who just popped inside as well. So a really good bottom mark running there for Azura, getting cleanly, crisply inside of both Sled and Allegri. They're behind them very, very, very tight. Um, platoon rounding, Onda not quite able to get their main sail in. Phoenix rounding really wide. And the only boat coming out to this left-hand side, Lunaranta. So they thought the 10 wasn't enough. They're going to go left one more time, but... Kind of deep in the pack here and, and just trying to get the into position. And perhaps, as we said earlier, it's better to ground left and tack off on support quickly than it is to be, say, on there right now and be in everyone's gas. And then just out the out the back, as you guys said, Prevets uh, have to take their kite down a bit early, perhaps just overstood or we're having some issues, but they're coming in uh, deep and slow and they're going to struggle to catch up with Lucy. Lunaris is just packed on support, so. Whether they can make some gains here, go from what was east to maybe fifth. Um, it's a reasonable guess because it's very, very tight, but the rest of the fleet all headed out to the right. Yeah, well, not super surprising there, but, uh, you know, definitely an interesting amount of gains and losses on that downwind. Just based, I mean, the guys that jived out early didn't look good, huh, Andy? No. So not really, but I mean, in saying that, neither did Azura, didn't, I don't think, lost anything or gained very much. For the uh, for the early jive, did they? 
No, so maybe you know maybe we're seeing a little bit more of an open race course, which could be a good thing uh, in terms of you know a little bit of a more exciting racing. But certainly exciting so far. The Prevetsa guys, hopefully they can catch up. The Luna Rosa, you know, coming out here, attacking right away. Not a surprising look for them. Uh, we'll see if they can, you know, join back with the fleet as they get up here. Certainly the less experienced teams uh, struggling a bit in these conditions. Onda, Phoenix and, uh, and Luna Rossa. Quantum Racing uh, leading Azura now up to, uh, up to second. I'm sure. Looking just now at uh, Onda then. Finally got their kite under wraps and just trying to get some clear air. Get Probably settled see back guys down and uh, again soon. quick look at Robert Scheidt's um, resume, if you like. Nine uh, laser world titles. I think he's got two uh, two star world titles and uh, five Olympic medals. Two gold, two silver, two bronze. Uh, sorry, one bronze. Quite I a think, resume. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, quite a resume. But I think uh, enjoying being out of the uh, of the Olympic class is obviously missing it. But uh, enjoying the new challenges, and uh, certainly this is a great challenge for him with this uh, almost all Brazilian team and well, a real galaxy of talent. Yeah, for sure, a very talented team, and definitely for Shite, you know, is a long experience in dinghies, but also a good amount of keelboat sailing. I mean, the starboat is, uh, yeah, yeah, you know. Up there in the in the powered up types of boats, so I'm sure he's uh, used to the. the Spent a little bit of time in the 49er as well. That's right, he has recently. Absolutely, he swim. He swims every day. He's uh, <laughs> he's pretty fit. You know, we saw him several times at the end of the day in uh, in uh, Zadar. Everybody else would be ready to uh, be having a beer or uh, a little bit of a sundowner and a debrief or whatever. And Robert would be off uh, for 15, 20 minutes swimming. He does that every morning when he can. He's in pretty good shape. So Quantum Racing really stepping away from the uh, the chasing pack. Azura, I think, uh, in control of the uh, next couple of boats. So looking pretty decent for Azura for the uh, for the day. We're on the second beat of race number two at the Rolex TP52 World Championship. Azura won the first race, lying second just now. They've got a little bit of uh, action on their hands with the uh, Allegra and Sled. Yeah, but definitely in a good spot, and you see them, you know, sort of marching along. They've definitely they've actually made a gain uh, according to you know virtual because they rounded the bottom mark in fourth. Yeah. Um, but if they can stay going fast up here and stay in a, in a in a powerful position, then by the time they get to ley line, being in front of those boats on the long starboard tack is going to be 
very powerful and very, very strong for them. So they're going to be happy with the situation that they're in and very happy that they could go fast sitting right behind Quantum, you know, and not, yeah. not in the best lane of all time. Um, and still going quite well against the boats until we were to them, so I'm sure they're exactly. happy with the that. Exactly, the two boats between, beside them, uh, Allegra and Sled having their own you know, a more private battle, shall we say, they're locked together, and it should work to Azura's advantage. Yeah, well that's the thing, and you see Quantum you know, extending their lead here as the other boats start to fight together, and in, in steady uh, venues like this, with you know, you'll see that the boat ahead or the couple of boats ahead will gain massively on the rest of the fleet as everybody has to do tax and maneuvers and pinch and go slow in order to gain a tactical advantage on the boats around them. The boats that are able to be free and slightly ahead are going to just going to keep getting further ahead, and it's sort There's of the rich get the richer. The view under the boom of uh, Luna Rossa just yeah. closing, I think, with um, not sure platoon. they're crossing here. Probably going to see a lee bow. Here they go. Jimmy Spithill first down on the runners. And indeed, Lee Bao uh, on Platoon. So Platoon can attack out. Yeah, there they go, attacking out here. So it's, you know, Platoon probably happy with that. And, uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure what's going on in their boat, but they're probably okay to send Luna Rosa towards the left side and gain the right side advantage and gain leverage towards that end that they know, or they're confident that they're going to get a, a, a shift in their favor and should be about a boat length game for Platoon at the top. If they're able to nail Leyline, then Lunaros has got to do an extra attack. So that's even more of a, of a loss for them. So here they go attacking back. No, they don't want to get that far away from the right side. So a uh, good, good tactical move on Platoon there. So we're seeing all the boats on the right side on the starboard now. So I'd say they probably attack when they're this far away. It's unlikely they're going all the way to ley line. They're probably going to attack about 20 boat lengths or 15 boat lengths before ley line, give themselves an option to do a double tack back if they have to. Um, but Sled certainly attacking on Allegra's hip, hoping maybe a five degree right shift might keep Allegra from tacking and crossing them um, or just trying to close as much gauge as they can to see if they can pass on the downwind. You know, it's all the middle of the course is all about ha setting up for the mark roundings in this fleet. Everybody is so close at the at the top and at the bottom that the middle of the course is on the runs and on the upwinds is just about can we can we compete with the other boats? Can we can we gain a little bit of speed here and there in order to be in a better position at the mark? So uh, quantum racing, uh, Dean Barker, as we said uh, on the on the helm this season another sailor with a huge uh, huge cv never been to the olympics but uh went through the dinghy classes was very very successful in the laser early on and in fact uh well, the info is saying 13th at the at the Athens Olympic Games. Oh, right enough, yeah. But his uh, his rivalry with uh, with Robert Scheidt goes back to the uh, ISAF Youth World Championships in uh, 1991, when they battled for the uh, Youth World title, and Dean came out on uh, Robert Scheidt, in fact, came out on top that year, and the ISAF Worlds, as you were saying. Just starting just now, uh, Nick. That's right, they are uh, down in uh, Corpus Christi. Good old home venue for me, well, sort of, United States. But anyways, Dean, you know, great, great match racer and certainly a fast, fast sailor with tons of experience. So, you know, he's going to be very, very strong uh, in these sort of tight battle situations where the boat handling is going to be very important. Um, and he's got a lot of experience doing, uh, you know, difficult maneuvers like that and a lot of experience reading what the other boats are about to do and what and what they might you know how they might come out of tacks or jibes or you know what their other tacticians are thinking about doing is going to be going to be very strong in that area so you know if the guys on board can make the boat go fast then Dean's going to be able to put it in the right position and it's going to be a very difficult team to beat in this venue. that the team that's sailing on board in this 
configuration, won the first regatta of this year as well. So Dean has a very good relationship with Terry Hutchinson going all the way back to the team New Zealand days when Terry was sailing with them on board. Um, they got to see that realign when they came together, uh, started racing the beginning this year, and, and they won the first event. So for sure, it was quite different conditions there. A lot of delays due to no wind and, as we said earlier, very shifty, um, more like bay sailing. But to see them get to perform like this, in green, it's a, it's a whole different ball game, but a, but a good ball game at the same time. And they won the practice race yesterday, this team of quantum racing, so doing quite well. Yeah, well, you know. Has packed off going for the dock here with Platoon, so there are things there's still enough time to get right to maybe make some games. Ducking Platoon, but I think they should be able to cross sled behind them, so yeah, a little bit more separated in this race than the last one, um, so it's going to be less action at the top mark for sure. Last time it was, you know, closer at the second top mark than it was at the first top mark. Um, but we're certainly going to see Azura try to squeeze in here between Sled and Allegra. I don't know. if you Do you think Sled's on Leyline out there, Jenny? Yeah, how badly Allegra is going to hit them is how, is whether or not it's going to dictate whether or not they can stay. As Allegra has been leave out, okay, leave out Azura, but Sled's packed off. So now Azura's free to do what they like. They can follow Sled and pack back out to the right when they feel like they have a good spot in the ways. And I think probably that's what we'll see them do if they think they don't have breathing room to Allegra. But I think they've so far sealed the deal of this third place on the upland. But as we saw the last downwind and, and the first race all together the, the downwinds are so critical here and the position changes so rapid um, that, that really not even first is, is in the bag yet for quantum racing but definitely from second probably all the way to fifth with platoon out here on the left side with fifth um, I don't think we could, we could say any of that we couldn't call any of those positions just yet yeah, it'll definitely be challenging. We saw Platoon put 200 meters on the fleet twice in two separate downwinds, so we'll see if they can make another gain like that this time. They weren't able to do it in the first round of this race, you know, a bit breezier, so maybe all the other teams are, are fat, you know, just as fast that all the boats are planning, but uh, we'll see. So meantime, the uh, World Championship uh, lead is in the balance between Quantum and Azura. At the moment, uh, it would be Quantum which would lead the uh, World Championship at the end of uh, uh, day one if things stay as they are just now. Allegri having a pretty solid day, all in all. Yeah, for sure, and they're in a very strong spot here. And according to Virtual, you know, those guys are on lay or, or overlaid. Uh, and if they're overlaid, Allegra is going to be very happy with where they are. You know, Platoon... Um, Platoon's done to gain as well. Well, I don't know. I mean, actually, you know, Virtual is saying they're starting to lose, although depending on where the ley line is, we'll see. Um, but definitely Lunarosa pushing them into that position. You know, there was quite a few tax yeah. and, uh, and, you know, star report situations between Lunarosa and Platoon. And you see Luna Rosa sort of putting themselves in the powerful position here. Uh, you know, and unless Platoon's going to be able to get a great lead bow on ley line here, they're probably going to end up seeing a duck. Uh, so, you know, well done on the Luna Rosa guys to, you know, push the other boat around next to them to put them in a weak spot and put the pressure on them to make the mistake, you know, and do a little bit of extra in order to get, get ahead. And, uh, you know, and especially when the breeze is, you know, quite strong, it's uh, putting pressure on the other teams can easily make them make a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that with, uh, you know, Prevetsa getting close to getting rolled and it's difficult for them to, you know, maybe they did catch a pot or something, but, you know, they're, the pressure's on from Onda and it's difficult for them to pay attention to everything that's going on when they're worried about another boat and suddenly there's a crab pot underneath their keel. Um, you know, it's, it just goes to show you what the power of putting pressure on from behind is. Um, so we'll see if Lunarosa overlaid, then maybe, you know, that's a mistake that took away all the gains that they made, but we'll have to have to wait and see as the mark comes along. 
So Platoon now on port, so we'll, you know, Lunarosa definitely pressing down against their jib. All those boats are going to be overlaid by a little bit. Quantum, the only one on ley line, maybe a little bit below ley line, it looks like. But going to extend their lead quite well here. So we'll probably see Platoon trying to tack inside and make it work. That's what I would do. You know, expecting more of a, of a right shift or more pressure, you know, you can always shoot at the end. So, uh, you know, good, go. good, well done by Platoon in order to do that, you know, if they're able to fit in there. A lot of pressure on from Lunarosa and, you know, Platoon able to boat handle their way and have good boat speed so enough that they can survive. In so a Danny, situation. Quantum round uh, with a nice lead then, and then second. Sled, is it? into the lead. It looks like Allegra into second. Allegra, sorry. We've then Azura in third. Sled just behind them in fourth. Quantum actually didn't gain as much as we thought they had. They did a double track right at the end for the rest of the fleet. So they're kind of up on a decent new line of Quantum. So it's a good job calling it way early and then just being a conservative double track later on to, to get themselves on a proper lay line. It's going up for Quantum here and it looks like a clean set. Freezes even down a little bit, actually. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, well, it certainly it seems like it's turned into a boat speed race and probably just going to see everybody basically driving on ley line to the finish and trying to keep the boat planing as long as possible and soak as low as they can while still still having the plane on. So big boat speed race here and a nice separation between the, the front and the back pack. So we'll see, uh, you know, we'll see if Platoon can close the gap uh, between them and Sled and see if Luna Rosa can pass them. That's, you Platoon know. Platoon are doing well, though, aren't they? Well, you know, we're looking at uh, Azura and Allegra yeah. and Sled here. So yeah, Azura, like I said, you know, putting the pressure on Allegra here, and it's going to be really difficult for Allegra to execute perfectly and not make a mistake. Um, so if there's going to be any action on this downwind, it's probably going to be between these two boats. And, you know, if Allegra not able to, to execute perfectly, we might see another problem on, on the boat. Well, the first action there, Azura throwing the gauntlet, going for the first jive out of the fleet. So I think... They almost saw Allegra as a little bit of a speed block. They tried to go high and get around them. Allegra defended. So then they kind of went low to their turn. And, and they, they were ultimately feeling faster than Allegra all the time. They couldn't get around them. So they went for the drive. I mean, that's from the outside, that's what it looks like. They went for the drive here. I think they're a touch early at late line, but at least it gives them a free, clear road to fail. Quantum Racing has just executed their drive behind. Both, both decent drives. Allegra now finally going their own drive and the kite taking a little bit longer to fill this than perfect um, in fact it's still not filled so a couple extra seconds as well so 
maybe that'll be a law still longer that allows the Zara to get by them in the future. But also in the future, when they come back together, it'll be a starboard port and it'll be favored to Azura. So it's good for them to take that initiative to jive first. The rest of the fleet following suit. So Sled's just jive behind almost on the exact same line as Quantum and Allegra. And then inside and, and up a bit, Platoon has gone for their jive. So perhaps a bit of a shift as well for, for the rest of the fleet. But it'll be an interesting one, I think, to see who gets to second place and who gets third. Yeah, well, you know, I would give it pretty heavily to Azura there. I mean, they, like I said, they did a nice job putting the pressure on early jive, and suddenly the tacticians are going to be looking back going, oh, are they on ley line? You know, are we in trouble here? Rushing the jive through. Oh, Allegra's wiping out. I'm interrupting, but massive wipeout, so a tiny pop, and they were not expecting it, and they have still not. They're kind of still flogging. They're still on their side, so... Allegra is definitely dropping that second position, and they are still not under control. They're just finally flattening the boat out and feeling. Like, nope. Okay, they can't. They they like can't get the boat under control. Bing off, guys. Okay, now the boat is flat. <laughs> the magazines. They're gonna refill it. So they kind of they sort of tried to refill the kite while they were still not in control of the boat. So the boat was still on its side a little bit, and they went to retrim, and they just wipe themselves out a second time, even though the big puck wasn't there anymore. So they've dropped from what was second definitely to, fourth. to third. Yeah. And I think probably they've been, yeah, they've been totally lost sled in that. Huge. Well, and now Platoon, you know, motoring away towards them. So if any more problem happens, then Platoon's going to pass them as well. So, you know, it's a really difficult situation to be in. And, uh, you know, Azura doing a really good job putting the pressure on them, making them drive late on the ley line, uh, you know, and they're already sailing a hot angle. So if anything changes, uh, you know, then they, they really don't want to put the bow down too much more. Um, you know, it's, and that's just sailing extra distance. So it's just, you know, difficult, very difficult position for them to be in. Platoon, really, I mean, I don't know what you see out there, Jenny, but on the on the screen here, it looks like Platoon's going quite well against them still and threatening <laughs> threatening a roll almost. So, and then they'll, the other question back in the, you know, as you go back towards the rest of the fleet is the Lunarosa Phoenix. You know, Lunarosa with the early drive means they have to do an extra maneuver, uh, which is quite slow in this. So, you know, we'll see if they can... Uh, Stay ahead of Phoenix, which rounded pretty close behind them. You know, it's all a speed game here, and then you, you're giving away five boat lengths by doing an extra job. So you got to make that up somewhere else. If it's uh, in boat speed, that's fine. If it's in a shift, that's fine. Uh, but it's got to come from somewhere. Not sure what happened to Ondo. We lost them on the virtual. I don't know if you can see them out there. But of course, they haven't come this distance down towards us. So I'm sure they're still behind. Um, Lunarosa has just jived themselves, so we'll be able to get a bit more of an impression from their angle what Onda looks like. But it is a very tight battle now between Allegra and Sled and Fortune. Allegra kind of finally got back under control and is able to keep their breeze clear of Platoon, but Platoon very much so uh, closed the gap. And now it's kind of a three horse race between those three. And the Luna Rosa coming back across, I think, will still be behind that whole pack, um, but probably ahead of Phoenix. And Phoenix might split them and Onda. Onda might be behind them as well. Yeah, well, you do so have to see there, another yeah. maneuver from Luna Rosa, so that could be interesting. You know, we saw that last time with the, you know, the, the, the late jibe. You have to choose to cross the guy or go in front of them, and, and a late jibe uh, toward, towards the finish is a difficult maneuver to make and very easy to get past when you're slow and, and the boat's a little bit down speed. And the, the other boat coming in with speed has a lot of options. As they come through the finish here, it's Quantum Racing taking the second race of the day, stamping an American flag on that race, and by quite a distance as well, but behind them, Azura did make the move into second place. They made the move look easy, and they're going to be the winners of the day with 
with the first and the second. So excellent job for this team, executing well in the breeze off of Cascai. And then behind the jiving duel commences, and it's Sled that's leading the jives of the three. They've completed their drive nicely. Behind them, Allegra just getting their kite full, but now the kite's breaking, and they really need to execute the jive well if they want to keep Platoon on their stern. So Platoon's just got as well. A nice drive for Platoon, but I think Allegra is able to hold them off. It looks like a boat length between the two. So Sled crosses the line now in third, two boat lengths back. Allegra is going to be taking this fourth position and another like and a half back. Probably Platoon at fifth, but on the inside here, Luna Rosa ripping in. And if they don't have to jive, they might just get Platoon right at the finish. And they're going deep for it. But whether or not they can make it without jiving or Platoon's going to make it. Uh, Platoon crosses, Luna Rosa crosses, I think. From the pin end, that's how I would call it. But from the boat end, they might have seen that differently. Might just they, be Luna Rosa. They, they said Lunarosa. Right, okay, so here it looked like Platoon just got it and then Lunarosa, but that, that is a very, very tight fight for what was fifth. Okay, and then behind them is all a very, very close battle. Phoenix and Onda both driving at the finish. Phoenix just able, not even to pull their snooker through, but able just to cross in front of Onda there. And then just back behind us, you can see the Seneca's back up for Provetta. So whatever the issue was on the first downwind, they were able to sort it out by the second downwind, and they are, they're sailing with a kite up, but yeah, they had, they had a kite issue and then a back down that meant that they are going to be finishing in line for this race. So a very intense first day, um, first couple of races here as well. And the breeze is kind of back down, but it's been it's been quite windy at points out here. I can definitely assert that everyone on this motorboat has, has seen a fair share of our um, Atlantic Ocean over our bodies and our faces and our sunglasses. Um, and I'm not sure about the sailors, probably much the same. It's, it's a beautiful day out here, though. No one's complaining. It's really nice, warm water and um, and beautiful breeze. And I think just as Prevets is crossing through, the breeze is kind of back up again to give them a couple final, uh, not surfs over these waves, but they are really, really skipping over the top of the waves. The red boat, all the crew back in the back of the boat. Now they're just kind of coming in together to get this kind of job, but... It's been a long range for these guys, looking out the rear view. I'm mostly looking at the front of, of the tackle in front of them. Yeah, well, the one thing about the long race for the guys that uh, have a little bit of issues is that at least it's beautiful in 20 knots and probably pretty fun to rip down one of these boats. So they're not going to be happy, but uh, at least it's fun out there. So... Uh Quantum Racing then will be leading uh, the uh, 52 Wor Rolex 52 World Championship after today with a 2 and a 1 versus Azura's 1 and a 2. <laughs> and uh, great races, great conditions. And let's have a look at the uh, very provisional uh, standings as at the moment. Well, this is first of all the uh, race result for number 2 for race two of the uh, Rolex TP50 World Championship here in Cascais. And it was uh, Quantum Ra Racing winning with Azura second, Sled in third. Fourth were Allegri, Allegri going two fourths today. Nice solid result for them on the uh, Randy Soriano and his team. Andy Horton calling tactics there. And so we're going to look at the regatta overall provisional, actually. Azura leading on three points. Well, actually, Quantum Racing would be leading. It's not with the uh, count back, but they're both on three points. So it's academic anyway. But uh, top two teams now five points clear of third place to Allegri. Allegri had two fourths today. Platoon, a s uh, five and a three for eight. Sled, uh, 11th. Uh, sorry, 11 points. Uh, Onda in sixth and 14 14 for Phoenix as well. 14 for Prevetza and Luna Rossa, courtesy of that uh, <coughs> 10 points in the first race because the uh, D or DNS, I think, they get. Then they're uh, down in the basement. But a great, uh, great day for Azura and Quantum in particular. Uh, and uh, we're expecting more of the same tomorrow, Nick. Yeah, I mean, for sure, you're gonna you're gonna see teams like Azura and Quantum, uh, you know, doing well with the with the pro drivers, and um, yeah. you know, 
Jenny, especially your, up in the breeze. Your thoughts before we lose you on uh, on day number one of the Rolex 52 World Championship. Quantum and Azura, kind of where you'd expect them. You know, I think, I think it's going to be a great week of racing out here no matter what. We know that there will be breeze every day. It might not be quite as windy as today. I think today was one of the bigger days in the forecast, but as we've seen, the fleet can really mix it up out here, both on the upwinds and the downwinds, and I think it's going to be about execution. We know that two of these boats can execute almost flawlessly, and it's just whether the rest of the pack can catch up as well. And I think it's going to be cool to watch no matter what. I don't know if I can make sense this early on. So, uh, Jenny, who's your money on then, having seen day one? Which what, Jenny? I said, who is your money on, having seen day one? <laughs> Oh, coming through day one. Okay. I just said it's too early to make sense, but okay. <laughs> I would say, I know, I did. I would say Azura wants it the most right about. How's that? I think they've got something I'll to do with that. I've had to rust got it so far, yeah. And I think, yeah. But again, I don't want to jinx it. So maybe, <laughs> so maybe I didn't just jinx it. Oh, man. Foot and mouth on that one. Exactly. Right. Well, yeah. That's, I love, that's, that's I love a woman with commitment, anyway. eh? Yeah. <laughs> Nick, your thoughts before we close. Oh, I mean, you know, there's going to be a couple of boats that are going to be way faster than the others, especially downwind, and we saw that today. But at the same time, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, positioning that can be won and lost, and um, so you can, you know, any of the boats can do quite well. Indeed. We'll uh, wait and see. But the uh, good thing is that the conditions are expected to be the same again tomorrow. I spoke with a couple of uh, sailors this morning. They said this is going to be a regatta uh, where the conditions are the same or close to the same every day. And uh, so that uh, shapes up beautifully for this uh, Rolex TP50 World Championship. Join us again tomorrow for all the action uh, from Cascais.